Jackie Lincoln is a vet who's been a park ranger officer for about 15 years. She specializes in high elevation mountain rescues, and is widely considered one of the best in her field. She was one of the more enthusiastic storytellers, and since we were together a fair amount during exercises, she ended up telling me about four that really stuck with me. The first she told me in response to my asking about her most traumatic calls. She shook her head and told me that really bad calls happen more frequently on the mountain, since the potential for nasty accidents is higher. About five years ago, one of the parks she worked at had a string of disappearances. It was a bad year, she said, one of the worst on record as far as weather went. They were getting about a foot of new snow every couple of days, and there were a few avalanches that killed some climbers. They've warned people about staying on the mapped areas, but of course there's always those who don't listen. In one particularly nasty case, an entire family got wiped out because the father decided he knew better than the officials, and he took them out into an area that wasn't safe. They were snowshoeing, and as best she could figure, they'd walked onto a shelf of snow that looked solid, but actually wasn't. It gave way, and this family went ass over tea kettle almost 300 feet down a slope. They landed on the rocks at the bottom, and the parents died instantly. One of the kids did as well, but the other two survived. One had a broken leg and fractured ribs, the other was almost unharmed save for some bruising and a sprained ankle. The uninjured child left his sibling behind and set out to find help. Jackie said the kid didn't make it more than half a mile before a storm overtook him. Kid stopped to try and get warm, or maybe just to rest, and ended up freezing to death. They ended up finding the family with the help of some witnesses who saw them heading out into the wilderness, and she was the one to find the kid who'd frozen to death looking for help. She said it had started to snow, just enough to obscure long-distance vision, but not enough to make searching impossible. She saw a figure sitting in the snow up ahead, and she got to it as quickly as possible. She described, in detail, how as she got closer, she realized first that it was a child, second that they were deceased, and third that they had frozen in one of the most pitiful positions she's ever found a corpse in. The kid was sitting upright, with his knees tucked up against his chest. His arms were curled around them, and his head was tucked up in his coat. When she moved the coat to look at his face, she saw that he died crying. His face was twisted, and the tears were frozen on his cheeks. She said it was painfully obvious that the kid was terrified when he succumbed to hypothermia, and as a mother, it broke her heart. She told me, repeatedly, that she hopes the father is burning in hell as we speak. The other traumatic story she told me that stood out, in my mind, was one that happened when she was a rookie. Her team got a report of an experienced climber who hadn't come home the previous day. His wife was convinced that something bad had happened, because he'd never failed to come home on time. They went out looking for him, and had to climb what sounded like some very technically challenging parts of the mountain. They got to a relatively flat area, and Jackie started seeing blood in the snow. She followed the trail, and as she went, she started seeing little bits of tissue. She wasn't sure exactly what body part it had come from, but the farther she followed it, the more there was. She follows this blood and tissue trail to a sheltered area under a cliff face, and she finds the climber. She said there was so much blood, more than she'd ever seen before. He was lying face down, one arm stretched in front of him, as if he died crawling. She looks closer, and sees that he's been partially disemboweled, which is where the tissue she'd seen had come from. The guy has an ice pick tucked into a hip holster, and it's covered in blood. Of course, they'll never be sure exactly what happened, but she said as best she can figure, this is what went down. The guy had been attempting to climb up to the next area, and had been using his ice axe to ascend. He'd probably hit a loose patch, and had fallen. On the way down, or possibly when he landed, he'd gotten impaled by the axe, and it had disemboweled him. He drug himself along, tearing pieces of himself out as he went, and had died under the cliff face. She isn't terribly bothered by gore, but I guess a few of the guys who came to help her remove the body threw up when they turned him over and a good portion of his intestines spilled out. I mentioned to her that I was interested in hearing about any experiences she had with people completely disappearing. Her eyes light up, and she leans in close to me. 
Wanna hear a real doozy? She asks. She tells me about how, when she first started, there was a case that got a lot of attention in the media. A family had been out berry picking in an area of the forest very close to the entrance of the park. They had two little boys, both under the age of five, and at some point during the day, one of them vanishes. There's an absolutely massive search, and they find absolutely nothing. It's another of those cases where it's like the kid was never there in the first place. The dogs just sit down and don't pick up on anything, no trace of the kid is found. The search goes on for about two months, but is eventually called off. Fast forward to six months later. The family comes back to place flowers at a memorial that's been set up there for the kid. They bring their other son. While they're placing the flowers, they lose sight of the kid for about three seconds, and in that span of time he vanishes into thin air. Now obviously, the parents are beyond devastated. It's awful enough to lose one child, but to lose two is beyond imagining. The search is huge, one of the largest in state history. There are about 300 volunteers combing every inch of this park, looking for the kid. But again, there's no trace of him. The search goes on for about a week, with people looking miles from the part of the park he vanished from. And then, almost two weeks later, a volunteer almost 15 miles from the designated search area radios in that he's found the kid. They assume that the kid was dead, but the volunteer says he's not only alive, he's in good shape. Jackie and her team go out to recover the kid, and when they get there, she can't believe that this is the kid that's been missing. His clothes are clean, there's no dirt on him anywhere, and he doesn't appear traumatized. The volunteer says he found the kid sitting on a log, playing with a little twig bundle that's bound together with some old rope. Jackie asks him where he's been, who he was with for those two weeks, and the kid tells her that he's been with the fuzzy man. Now Jackie firmly believes in Bigfoot, so she gets all excited and asks what he means by fuzzy. Was he hairy? But the kid says no, he wasn't hairy. He was a fuzzy man, and he describes a man that's blurry, like when you close your eyes but not all the way closed. He says the man came out of the trees and took the kid with him deep into the woods. The kid says he slept in a hollow tree, and the fuzzy man gave him berries to eat. Jackie asks if the man was mean, if he scared the kid, and the kid says no, he wasn't scary. But I didn't like how he didn't have eyes. Jackie says they get the kid back to headquarters, and a cop takes him into town to talk to him more about what happened. She's friends with the cop that talked to him, and she said the kid described being kept in this tree by the fuzzy man, and given berries whenever he was hungry. He was allowed to wander around a very specific clearing, but when he tried to go further, the fuzzy man would get mad and yell real loud even though he didn't have a mouth. When the kid got scared at night, the fuzzy man made it go brighter and gave him the twig bundle. He said the fuzzy man was going to keep him, but he had to let him go because the kid wasn't the right kind. He either can't or won't elaborate more on that. The cops are just sort of left scratching their heads, and the search for his brother is renewed with no results. The kid has no idea where his brother might be, and they never find him. The last story that Jackie told me was of something that happened to her when she got separated from her training group when she was a rookie. They were learning the basics of high elevation belaying on a well-mapped side of the mountain, and she had to use the bathroom. She went off about 50 yards from the group during a meal break, and did her business. I'll tell the rest exactly as she told it to me so I gotta take a piss, and once I'm done, I start going back to the group but I've only gotten about five feet when I realized that I have no idea where I am. And this wasn't a, oh, I got turned around lost. I mean, I had literally no clue where I was. If you'd asked me, I don't even think I'd have been able to tell you what state we were in. It was sort of how I imagine people with amnesia feel, you know? You're completely lost, and you have no idea what to do. So I stood there for a while, just trying to figure out where I was and what I was supposed to do. But the longer I stand there, the more confused and turned around I get, so I started walking. As I recall, I just picked a random direction and went for it. And as I'm walking, it's just getting worse and worse to the point where I have no concept of why I'm on the mountain in the first place. I'm just trudging through the snow, and then I start hearing this voice. 
It's kind of inside my head, almost. Like if a frog could talk, all low and croaky. And it's telling me over and over it's okay, it's okay, you just need to find something to eat. Find something to eat and you'll be okay, just keep walking and find something to eat. 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 So I start looking around for anything that I can eat, and I swear to God I've never felt that hungry in my whole life. It was bottomless, and I think I'd have eaten just about anything you put in front of me right then. I had no concept of time, so I had no idea how long I'd been out when I hear an actual voice coming toward me. I go toward it and see one of the other SARs, and he looks terrified. He's running toward me, asking if I'm okay and what the hell I'm doing out here. And the scary thing was, as he's running toward me, I kind of see myself reaching into my belt for my hunting knife. I'm not even really thinking about what I'm doing, but what I am thinking is that I have to eat. If I don't eat, I'll never be okay again, so I just have to eat. He sees me doing that and he backs off right away. He yells at me to put my knife away, that he's not gonna hurt me, and that kind of snaps me back. All of a sudden, I know exactly where I am, and I put the knife away. I run to him and ask him how long I've been gone, thinking he'll tell me I've been gone for half an hour or so. But he tells me I've been gone for two days. I've gone over two peaks and ended up almost on the other side of the mountain, and if I'd kept going, I would have ended up wandering into about 300 miles of wilderness. They'd never have found me. He can't believe I'm not dead, and of course I don't know what to think. To me, no time has passed at all. I don't say anything, I just go back with him to a rendezvous point, and I'm taken back to HQ to be airlifted to the hospital. When I get there, they do all kinds of tests, and try to figure out what happened. As best they can guess, I had some kind of weird fugue state, which is kind of like amnesia, or a weird seizure that knocked my brain out of whack. But the truth is that we really don't know. It's never happened again, but I'll tell you, ever since then I never go out there alone. People rag on me for making them come with me when I have to leave the group, but I just tell them that listening to me piss in the snow is better than losing me for two days on a freezing mountain. The next person I talked to was E.W., a former trainer who now works as an EMT. He still comes to ops like this to help out, but doesn't work full time for us anymore. He specialized in finding lost kids, he just seemed to have a sixth sense when it came to knowing where they'd gone. He's a legend among the more senior vets, but he gets embarrassed if you compliment him on his work. He sat down with me at dinner one evening, and we ended up swapping stories. Most of them were just casual, but when we got on the subject of our weirder calls, I mentioned that I'd had a buddy who'd gone up a set of stairs. He got kind of quiet and asked me if I'd heard of a little boy who'd disappeared from his park a few years back. I hadn't, so he told me this story. They were out looking for this 11-year-old boy, Joey, who'd gone missing near a river. Of course, the first thought was that he'd fallen in and drowned, but when they brought dogs out, they led SAR officers away from the river and up into a very densely forested area. When we do searches for people, we search in a grid pattern, and we search every box of the grid incredibly thoroughly. What EW's team noticed right away was that a very strange pattern was emerging. Dogs in alternating boxes were picking up Joey's scent, but losing it when they overlapped with another box. If you think of a checkerboard, Joey's scent was being picked up in random black squares, but never in red. This, of course, didn't make any sense, because how could the kid bounce from area to area without leaving a scent in each place he passed? EW and his partner pass into a new box of the grid, and EW notices a set of stairs about 50 yards away. He tells his partner that they need to go check near it, but his partner flat out refuses. He tells EW that he's made it a point never to go near any stairs he sees, and that while it may be routine, he's not to pretend that it's normal. He tells EW that he'll wait in sight while EW checks. EW says he was irritated, but he felt for the guy, and didn't push him on the subject. I walked over to the stairs. They were small, kind of like stairs into a basement. I don't really feel strongly one way or the other about them, the stairs I mean, so I wasn't scared or anything. I guess I'm like everyone else, and I'd just prefer not to think about them too much. Anyway, 
I went over and I could see that there was something lying on the bottom step, sort of curled up. My hair sinks, because of course you always hope for the best. And we were confident that we'd find this kid alive, because he'd only been missing for a few hours. But I knew right away that it was him, and that he was dead. He was curled up in a little ball on the step, holding his stomach. It looked like he'd been in horrible pain when he died, but I didn't see any blood except some on his lips and chin. I radioed him that I'd found him, and we got his body back to command. That poor family, they were devastated. The parents couldn't understand how he'd be dead, cause he'd only been gone for such a short amount of time. And on top of that we didn't have any obvious cause of death, which just made it worse. I figured he'd probably eaten something poisonous, since he was holding his stomach when I found him, but I didn't want to guess. It's hard enough to hear that your kid is dead, let alone have some stupid SAR guy guessing about what happened. They took him away, and I went home and tried not to think about it. I hate finding dead kids, man. I love this job but it's one of the reasons I left. I've got two daughters, and the thought of losing them that way just. He choked up a little here. I'm not great with emotional stuff like that, and it's always sort of awkward to see a grown man cry, so I didn't really know what to do. He pulled himself together eventually, though, and he kept going. We don't always hear back from the coroners about cause of death. It's not really our job to know, I guess, and sometimes if they think it's foul play they won't tell us because of legal bullshit. But I've got a friend who works for the sheriff's department, and he'll usually pass along any interesting info if I ask. In this case, though, I actually got a call from him about a week later. He asks if I remember the kid, and of course I do, and he says some seriously weird shit is going on. He tells me, EW, man, you're gonna think I'm crazy, but the coroner has no idea what happened to this kid. He's never seen anything like it. My friend goes on to tell me that when the coroner opened the kid up, he couldn't even believe what he was seeing. The kid's organs were like Swiss cheese. Quarter-sized holes were punched clean through just about every single organ this kid had, aside from his heart and lungs. But his colon, his stomach, his kidneys and even one of his testicles, were full of these clean holes. My friend said the coroner described it as if someone had taken a hole punch and punched holes out of everything, they were so neat. But the kid didn't have a scratch on him, no entry or exit wounds. The closest anyone there had ever seen like it was a guy who'd filled himself full of buckshot a year or so back while cleaning his rifle. No one had a clue what could possibly have caused it. My friend asked me if I'd ever heard of anything like it, or if we'd had similar cases in the past. But I'd never even heard of something like that, and I told him I wasn't going to be of any help to him. As far as I know, the coroner determined the cause of death as something like massive internal bleeding, but no one knows what really happened. I've never been able to forget that kid. I have nightmares about it sometimes. I don't let my kids go into the woods alone, and when we go together I never let them out of my sight. I used to love it out here. But that case, and a couple others, just sort of ruined it for me. Dinner was over, so we started to clean up and go back to our cabins. Before we went our separate ways, he put his hand on my shoulder and looked at me really close. He tells me that there's bad things out here. Things that don't care if we have families or lives, or that we can think and feel. He tells me to be careful, and he walks away. I didn't have a chance to talk with him again, but that story stuck with me. By pure coincidence, I got to talk to another vet, PB who's been in the SAR field for years. We were partnered on a grid sweep during a training exercise, and we were chatting casually about how we liked the job, what kinds of things we'd seen, and the like. At one point, we passed an old set of stairs, though these were probably from an old fire lookout, given the area that we were in. I sort of casually mentioned that I was curious about the stairs, and that I wished I knew more about them. He got kind of quiet and looked like he wanted to tell me something, but wasn't sure if he should. Finally, he told me to turn my radio off. Obviously this is something we are never, ever supposed to do, but I did it, and he did the same. About seven years ago, he tells me, he was out on a call with a rookie. They were in an area of the park that's had a lot of strange reports and events. 
disappearances, stories about lights in the forest, odd noises, things like that. The rookie was totally spooked, kept going on and on about things out in the woods. According to PB, the guy wouldn't stop talking about the goat man. Just on and on, goat man this and goat man that. Finally, I told him that there was plenty else to be afraid about here that was very real, and that he'd better get over this thing with the goat man. The rookie wanted to know what kinds of things I was talking about, and I just told him to shut up and walk. We crested a little ridge and there was a staircase about 10 yards ahead. The rookie stops dead in his tracks and just stands there looking at them. I tell him, see? That's something you should be afraid of. The rookie asks me what the hell these are doing out here, and for some reason, I just open up and tell him the truth. Or what I've been told is the truth. I could have gotten in a lot of trouble for doing what I did, and I could get in a lot of trouble for repeating it to you. But you're a nice kid, and I want you to stop looking into this. Quit while you're ahead. So I'll tell you what I know, under the condition that you never breathe a word of this to the soups. I told him I wouldn't say a word, and he double checks that our radios are off. When I first started out, we were a little less tight-lipped about them, and other things that happen out here. We warned people before they were even hired that there was weird shit going on. I guess the Forest Service was tired of having such a massive turnover rate, and they wanted people to know what they were getting into. So they started having people sign these agreements that they wouldn't go to the media about what they were going to see. The FS didn't want to scare people away, so the last thing they needed were spooked rookies running off to the media with stories of ghosts and haunted stairs. But eventually, they found that the agreements weren't necessary. People not only didn't want to talk about what they saw, they wouldn't. A few times, media tried to talk to people when kids or hikers would disappear, and no one would say a word. I can't really explain it. I guess we just don't really want to admit anything is wrong. This is our job, to be out in the woods every single day. We don't need to be spooked, and the best way to avoid that is to pretend like everything's okay. So I'll tell you everything I can think of, and after that, I'm done talking about it for good. And I expect you not to bring it up around me, ever. The stairs have been out here as long as the parks have existed. We have records going back decades describing them. Sometimes people go up them, and nothing happens. Other times. Look, I really don't like talking about this, but sometimes, really bad shit happens. I saw one guy get his hand sliced clean off when he got to the top step. He reached out to touch a tree branch, and it happened so fast. One second his hand was there, and the next it was gone. Completely clean wound. We didn't find his hand, and the guy almost died. Another time, a woman touched one of the stairs, and a blood vessel in her brain exploded. Literally exploded, like a water balloon. She sort of stumbled down and came over to me, and all she got out was I think something is wrong with me. She dropped like a sack of flour, dead before she hit the ground. I'll never forget the way the blood leaked into the inside of her eye. Before she died, I watched it turn red. I watched it happen and there wasn't a single thing I could do to help. We warn people not to go anywhere near them but there's always at least one idiot who does. And even if nothing happens to them, something bad always happens. Kids go missing as we're on their trail. Someone dies the next day, cut in half in a completely safe part of the park. I don't know why, but something bad always happens. I don't know exactly why they're out here, but it doesn't matter. They're here, and if we were smart, we'd tell our new officers exactly what they're capable of. We were both quiet for a little while. I was afraid to talk because I wasn't sure if he was done. He looked like he wanted to say something else. Finally he spoke up again. Have you ever noticed how you can't find the same ones twice? I nodded, expecting him to continue. But he just stayed quiet, walking alongside me, and eventually he started a story about the biggest deer he'd ever seen in the park. I didn't bring up the subject again, and I didn't press him for any more stories. He dropped out of the op the next day. Apparently he left before the sun came up, he said he was sick. None of us have heard from him since he left.
I grew up in the Southwest and when I was in high school, my friends and I would often have bonfires on the weekends. We would go gather a ton of pallets from the industrial park and load them into our trucks and take off out in the desert and stack them high and dose them in gasoline. While the fire burned, we'd always goof off and just chat. Well one night while the fire was burning low and we were about to head to sleep, we realized we'd never really driven beyond where we usually stop and have a bonfire. We were really out of ways from town but we thought, heck why not? So we decided to drive down the road further into the desert. The moon was shining bright that night and odd shadows formed. As we drove through ravines and along small hills we noticed a bunch of cars out in the distance. We decided to cut the lights and the engine and set out on foot to investigate. I mean, who could be out here all this way? As we started walking towards the cars, we made sure to be extremely quiet and careful not to make a noise. In hindsight, this probably wasn't the wisest move we've ever made but we were curious. After walking close to the vehicles we realized they weren't occupied. But then we started to hear some voices in the distance over a ridge. As we got closer we saw some tents and we heard two sets of voices. One was a set of adults and the other a set of youth. We had stumbled upon a boy scout camp out. Now, what to do? We could hear the adult boy scout leaders at their wits end in their tent telling everyone in the other tent, the youth tent which was a ways off from the adult tent to shut up and go to bed. Mind you it was probably past midnight. The leaders then indicated that if they heard one more peep they were going to pack up and head home that night. The boys shut up and then all was silent. My friends and I naturally agree it would be hilarious to go and mess with the kids and try to scare them. So we tiptoed over to the boys' tent and in a deep quiet voice whispered things through the tent wall, we made sure we weren't letting the moon cast our shadows onto the tent. We did it so subtly that it made them wonder if they heard anything at all. We whispered morbid things like I'm going to slice your throat. Or you better not fall asleep. Etc. We started to hear the boys getting panicked inside their tent and whispering to each other. One of them called out to their leaders and they just responded back by telling them to shut up and that this was their final warning. Then one of my friends started imitating some sort of wild beast. We all started clawing on the tent and making noises and they could see our shadows finally on the thin tent walls. The boys were straight up freaking out and yelling for their leaders. The leaders were super are pissed now and yelled they were getting dressed and that the boys should get dressed too because they're all going home now since none of them can shut up and go to bed. We hightailed it out of there and made it back to our vehicles and drove home. We thought we were so funny but in hindsight it's a pretty dickish thing to ruin a scout camping trip, but it was kind of worth it. My only regret was that we didn't stay behind and hide in the bushes to see how it all played out and if the leaders would believe the boys' hysteria. Scouts, if you're reading this, I'm sorry and I hope I didn't scar you for life in regards to camping and having people believe you. Have a good laugh about it now? Maybe? In 2016 my boyfriend, now my husband, and I went camping in eastern Pennsylvania. The place we decided to stop for the night was primitive. Camping was free, no cell service, barely a road, etc. We did encounter two other people. They might not factor into what happened later at all but they were creepy so I'll describe them. The first was a woman who had her truck off to the side of the road a little as we drove past. She had the hood open and seemed to be waiting for someone to stop and offer to help. Usually my boyfriend had no problem helping someone but he said his time something about her put him off. She didn't really seem like she needed help and usually people who need help look at you hopefully as you approach. She looked like she just expected we would stop. That's what my boyfriend said anyway, I hadn't really noticed anything that's strange about her. The next person came when we had chosen a spot and were setting up a fire for hot dogs. I had noticed people drive by a few times but my boyfriend pointed out each time was the same car and the man in the car watched us each time he passed. 
My boyfriend was a little uneasy about this but we had driven around for a while before finding a place we liked. It had been raining and everything was muddy and we wanted the driest site possible. He could have been doing the same thing. We briefly thought about moving but the road was muddy too. If he wanted to find us all he had to do was follow the tracks. There were some other tracks but not many. He'd only have to backtrack a little to locate us again. He didn't come by another time so we stayed and spent the several remaining hours before dark goofing off. No one else drove by. Whether or not those two had anything else to do with our experience, the real fear came later. We had gone to sleep in our tent and sometime around 3 am we were awoken by this very loud noise. I can't describe it very well or even remember exactly what it sounded like but my boyfriend said it reminded him of a chain gun revving up. It was also similar to how it would sound if someone recorded a shovel being dragged over gravel and played it over a loudspeaker is another way he described it. He jumped up and looked out the little window but couldn't really see anything. The sound repeated itself another few times. I was too scared to speak so my boyfriend whispered that it was probably miles off and I should go back to sleep. I didn't question this as I figured loud sounds could be easily heard miles off. After we left he told me it sounded like it had actually been coming from just down the road but he didn't want to freak me out. Looking back I probably should have wondered why he would bother to whisper if apparently the sound was far off. I was still terrified. Every little thing I heard outside sounded like someone was walking around the tent. We laid there for a while longer when finally my boyfriend told me to get dressed because we were leaving. I got got alarmed by this and even more alarmed when he unwrapped the machete we had bought just for this trip from its plastic before opening the tent. We quickly packed up and loaded the car. I looked around for footprints that weren't our own, but despite the moon providing plenty of light I couldn't really see. I did point out something my boyfriend hadn't noticed though before we got into the car. There was a beer can by our dead fire that hasn't been there before. We didn't even bring beer. While we were driving away my boyfriend explained that he was nervous someone might have been trying to lure us out, so he didn't think it was a good idea to run from the tent right away. He also half expected to find out gas tank had been siphoned out, but that wouldn't have stopped us because we had a hybrid car. We joke that that would make a funny hybrid commercial. Number of brutal murders avoided by driving a hybrid, too. We only joke because we were about pissing ourselves from fear and adrenaline even then. The rest of our trip we only stayed in well-populated campsites or got a hotel. When I was in the scouts, or rather the local equivalent, legally adult scouts had to do the three feather challenge. One day without food, one day without speaking, and one day and night alone in the woods with only a knife and a tarp, unseen by any human, after which one has to sneak back to the scout camp unnoticed by the sentries and report to the campmaster. It was my third day, so I took off, walked for miles through the woods and found the most remote spot in the wildest, most overgrown part of the woods. Spent a spooky but uneventful night until almost before dawn when I decide to go for a morning swim in the lake right before taking off to go back. I stripped nude, and went towards the lake, but noticed a group of guys fishing so decided to go back. Suddenly, the ground underneath my feet caved in, and I found myself submerged up to my armpits in the absolute vilest mass I have ever smelled. It was a pit where poacher dumped the guts and leftovers of illegally hunted deer, and it fermented for weeks. Imagine the scene, a group of anglers hear some ungodly screaming from the direction of the woods, and run there to see if someone needs help. What they see is a teenager-shaped ghoul covered completely in blood and rotten offal, who is crawling out of a bloody hole in the ground, while shrieking and weeping then runs at them, to get to the lake and wash off. One of my best buds from college was a geologist major that ended up becoming a ranger in the southeast US. Haven't spoken in years, 
as is the case with age, but I remember about eight to nine years back he was telling me about an old married couple that he had recently helped out. He had seen them come to the park several days in a row, and found out they were visiting from out west, and they had gotten engaged their decades prior. They had been searching for a spot they'd taken pics of where he popped the question but were having trouble. After looking at the pics and figuring out roughly where they were trying to get to he escorted them in his vehicle, then hiked with them to where he thought it would be. They found it, and he left them there and went back to his station at the entrance. He said he got a weird feeling once he got back and felt like he needed to wait to see them whenever they left. Well, once it came time to lock up at night he still hadn't seen them leave, so he reported it, left his assistant to wait at the shack at the entrance, and went back to where he left them. He found both of them lying down spooning along the bank of the river. Neither were alive. He called the cops, went through the nine yards, and went home. The police were able to disclose to him their identities, but weren't sure anything else initially. Later he learned that the wife was terminally ill with cancer, and they had both committed suicide by ingesting some sort of chemical-slash-pill combination medley. They just chose to do it where they had gotten engaged at. My bud wasn't torn up about it. He was obviously sad for about them dying, but said that he thought they hadn't asked for help earlier because they didn't want anyone to think they helped kill them. My cousin is with the Forest Service in the Montana slash Wyoming area and I decided to go up there with her to literally test the waters. She does hydrology and has to ride out to the middle of nowhere to test streams and snow runoff to ensure no contaminants, so I thought that sounded fun and wanted to do a bit of a tour with her. We were going to have to camp out there for two nights, so we packed up all our gear in saddlebags or saddle bundles and started out. The first day and night was amazing beautiful scenery and amazing air quality. It really is so peaceful out there. I love that area and wish I got to go up there more often. Anyway, we started out on the second day and my cousin said, you want to see something weird? Of course I said yes, so she led me on a bit of a side journey into this tiny little ravine. We ended up traveling about two hours away from our actual path we had laid out. At the very end of this fold in the land, she dismounts and tells me to get off my horse, too. We tie them up in this gorgeous little clearing and she tells me to follow this tiny wildlife path and bring our little rechargeable radio. It is one of those you can plug in or wind up, and it also acts as a lantern if you really need it to, but that kills the batteries quickly. I do and, out in the middle nowhere, there is a huge coil of wire sticking out of the ground. The wire itself was not weirdly large, like some buried transmission wire, but small, like 10 or 12 gauge wiring for a house. It trailed off into the brush and trees, so naturally I decided to follow the damn thing out of curiosity. My cousin trails behind me as I do, and this wire, after coming straight up from the ground, is strung across limbs of trees then back to the ground, then it snakes around rocks and finally dead ends into an outlet. That outlet is mounted on the side of a desk. It looks like a school teacher's desk from when I was growing up, with a metal base and a pseudo wood slash plastic top thing. No chair, no building, no nothing, just this outlet and this desk. I am staring confused as all hell at this desk in the middle of a forest when my cousin takes the radio, pulls out the cord, and plugs it into the outlet. That thing then lit up and started blaring static. The wire was being fed from somewhere. Now, the place where we were had no road access, no buildings for many miles, and no other people around. And yet, there was a live outlet. Weird. No spooky jump scares or bodies, just one, lone power desk in the middle of the woods. I wish I had taken a picture of it. I was camping in the Everglades. Due to back problems I sleep in the back of my car. What I didn't mention is it's a convertible with a cloth top. I hear something walking on it. I know it's a raccoon and I can tell it's pretty heavy. 
I'm worried he'll rip through the top. So I push at it to try to get him off. He leaves, but he comes back. This goes on for a while. Then it stops, so I try to go to sleep. It was December, but it was still warm so I had the windows open. I hear something, and when I open my eyes the raccoon is sitting in the driver's seat staring at me over the back of it. I chase him out. Still can't sleep, so I go to the bathroom. Next morning I get up and the wrapper from the loaf of bread that I had stored in the well behind the back seat where the convertible top folds into is lying there empty under a tree. When I was in the bathroom the raccoon had climbed in and stolen it. I felt sorry for the raccoon. That was 18 slices of double fiber bread. So 126 grams of fiber in one sitting. I could only imagine what it did to his digestive system. I was hiking in Andorra with a friend. Long story short, we got lost off the trail and ended up in Spain. Found another trail and were following it, without a map. A while ahead of us we see a man with two golden retrievers walking in the same direction we are. He looks young and is carrying climbing gear over his shoulder. We're rushing down the trail to catch up with him and finally do. We ask him for help with directions, and he tells us exactly where we are and where we need to be, about 12 kilometers away there's a town with a hotel. He says there's another, smaller, town about 6 kilometers away and that he parked his car there. He says he can give us a lift for the last 6 kilometers if we like, but says that he's in a hurry. We are over the moon and so we hike together for a while. The dogs are nice and friendly, running circles around us. We are chatting away to the guide and he is really nice, but my friend and I are getting tired and so we cannot keep pace with him for long. The trail bends away to the right and the man, now a bit ahead of us, disappears behind the bend. We get there a couple of minutes later, and the trail is empty, no man, and no dogs, even though the trail is a straight run for quite a while and we should have been able to see them. The two of us continue on, alarmed, waiting to hear slash see something, or perhaps be murdered by a stranger. Nothing. We get to the town eventually, and from there made it to the safety of the hotel in the next town over. We were completely freaked out by his sudden disappearance and to this day we are both convinced he was a ghost. Why I'm no longer a park ranger at the Yellowstone National Park. When the call about the missing campers and the abandoned campsite came in, I was sitting in front of the park ranger station, watching a fire that crackled in the rusted old pit that's been here for decades. The flames were slowly eating the wood, the heat occasionally sputtered and spat as the pine logs were devoured. It's one of my favorite ways to pass the time out here. A fire, like watching fish in an aquarium or animals in a zoo, is endlessly captivating because it's a tiny bit of nature captured and put on display. The same reason people come here to the Spruce Ridge National Park. And just like a fire, the woods here can scorch you if you're not careful. I shuffled back inside, took the call, and headed out for the rendezvous point after listening to the report for a few minutes. Another couple gone missing. Nothing too out of the ordinary, at least not yet. So I loaded my gun, hopped in my jeep, and headed out as the sun began to recede past the trees. The searing summer sun peeked out from between dense fir limbs that surrounded the rocky terrain on all sides, sweeping over the horizon as far as I could see. I passed glimmering ponds filled with algae and pavilions filled with brown picnic benches as the jeep bounced up and down on carefully maintained blacktop and rutted brown roads filled with dirt and rock. I could practically hear the croak of frogs, the chirping of crickets, and the hum of a few dragonflies as I sped past. No matter how long I was a park ranger, I never got used to the thrill of the great outdoors. The serenity you could find in the fresh air was eternal, as was its sheer size. It reminds me of pioneer days when it was just a few families alone in the vastness of the frontier. And it was a very unforgiving frontier. 
Back then, there were no rangers or park security like me to make sure no families got lost. First aid didn't exist, and Mother Nature never suffered fools. Some people have forgotten that. But Mother Nature never hesitates to remind people about what she can do. Lately she seems particularly active on that front in these parts. I carefully maneuvered the jeep through hills, which were bigger the farther I got away from the base. The wind lashed through the cracked windows as I passed fallen cedar trees on the way to my destination. I love these woods, but I never forget how merciless they can be and how many people have met their end out here. How many bodies have been buried right here? How many people went out into these woods and simply never came out? There's no way of knowing for sure, but these woods have been around for centuries, and that's enough time for death to plant a seed for every tree out here. I was dispatched to find Libby and Dale Morrison, a well-to-do couple that had gone out on a camping vacation. Their empty campsite had been found by a group of hikers and since no one had seen the couple for a few days, I was sent out to take a closer look. Funny enough, while I've always loved the outdoors, I've never liked camping. If you fill out enough missing persons and death reports, you learn fast to treat the woods like a tiger or lion. They might be stunning to look at, but never forget what can happen when you encounter them. Although plenty of people have wised up and learned how to camp safely, camping certain places alone is a bit like putting out a candy bowl on Halloween with a please take one, sign with no one to watch. Not everyone who walks by has to ignore the rule and do whatever they please. All it takes is one. It may have only taken one person to make my brother-in-law Jerry vanish a few weeks ago. National parks seem so humdrum and tame, but anyone who works at one knows there's a lot of dark things that happen within those trees. Cults will meet here, drug deals go down and go wrong, people vanish, and plenty of murders all happen within these woods. Bodies are dumped here and found days, weeks, or even months later, all torn to pieces from the animals and no coroner could figure out how they got that way. I've interviewed plenty of applicants who think this job is some cakewalk and an easy paycheck. They all get a nasty wake-up call sooner or later and it either sobers them up or makes them run out of here like they've been chased out. And I've seen things that I don't blame them for wanting to run from. People have been afraid of monsters in the woods for centuries. I don't expect that to change anytime soon, no matter what modern technology exists. That's why the single best alarm system that ever existed is man's best friend. The minute a dog starts barking you know someone, or something, is there. But when you're outside and your dog whimpers and runs away like the ground is on fire, that's your cue to get out. It's no coincidence that in all the time I've been on duty here, I've never had to deal with a situation where one or more person involved had a dog. Never. Back at the station that houses my office, there's an entire bulletin board with missing persons flyers. Most of them are couples or entire families. Wholesome looking, happy, and smiling at the camera. Like they don't have a care in the world. Which is usually how they end up on the wall in the first place. I was about to find out whether the Morrisons would join them. It's not a task I enjoy at all. In the five years I've had this job, I've taken off maybe 10 of those flyers. And not because the people on them were found safe and sound either. Most people on it are the type of people who think because they have GPS and cars with all the latest bells and whistles, there's nothing to worry about when you camp or venture into the woods. A lot of people who venture out here have that attitude. If they're lucky, they realize the mistake and live to talk about it. Other times not so much but maybe their fate can help teach others a lesson. I've certainly had to deal with my share of journalists, documentary filmmakers, law enforcement officers from various divisions, private investigators, and inquiring relatives and friends. The professionals I have no problem dealing with. They're just doing a job, same as me. That's not to say they don't take what happens seriously or feel bad for the parties involved. Not at all. But they're used to dealing with stuff like this for the most part and it rarely touches them personally. Only rarely do I see the look in their eye that tells that what happened here will haunt them. On the other hand, dealing with family members in that situation is by far the worst part of my job. 
I'd rather stumble upon a million bodies than have to deal with grieving family members. I've done it too many times, but it never gets any easier. Never. And it shouldn't. It was dark by the time I arrived at the Morrison campsite, which was a long way from any main area. As expected, they had spared no expense and had gone camping with brand new gear that I was certain they had just bought. Brand new equipment, cooking gear, and a black SUV that was still gleaming like it was fresh off the lot. I did have to concede that Mr. and Mrs. Morrison picked a terrific spot, right on the lake. It was a clear night and the moon glistened off the calm surface, which looked like glass. No matter what happened on the job, nighttime was always my favorite time to work or do anything else, so long as I took proper precautions. I suppose it's the same reason people think about hitting up an old flame late at night. In the modern era, it's easy to look down upon more primitive times and their fears about what lay just out of sight in the darkness. But come out here at night when it's pitch dark, and those fears suddenly become far more relatable. Modern technology may be the 21st century, but where your flashlight ends, it's the 19th century. All it takes is for your flashlight to run out of batteries, your GPS to fail, or your car to not start, and you're no longer in modern times out here. You're right back where your ancestors were. But at least they knew how to survive in conditions like that. As I looked around the campsite, the stars gleamed out of the sky and looked brighter than usual. I don't think people think about space, as in really think about it and what it entails. It's a stunning concept to behold. The vastness of the galaxy and all the galaxies beyond it. When you think about it, Earth is nothing more than a tiny apartment in a massive skyscraper when you think of how massive space is. The phrase outer space invokes gargantuan size and a scale that is unfathomable. When pondering this, the two most terrifying concepts and their implication are that you are completely alone in the universe, and you are not alone in the universe. Which one is more terrifying depends a lot on the person. The phrase in space, no one can hear you scream, is so much more than a movie tagline. It's a simple fact. Because not only can no one hear you scream, you might not even be able to scream, which is one of the most horrifying feelings a human can experience. It's like calling for an ambulance only to be told help isn't coming. The woods are the same way, as it's no coincidence they refer to space as the final frontier. It's also what makes someone going missing in a huge park like this such a nightmare for a search party. In a populated area you can rule areas out and narrow things down, but out here in the woods, someone could be literally anywhere. The Morrison campsite wasn't torn to shreds like it had been attacked by a wild animal, nor did it resemble the scene of a horror movie-style bloodbath. It looked like countless campsites that had been abandoned without an afterthought. Had it not been for their car nearby, I would have thought they just left on a whim. Their car, a shiny black Cadillac SUV with a grill hood that gleamed in the light from my flashlight, was still here. So that meant they either left in someone else's car, they ran off somewhere outside the park, or they were still here. But it wouldn't be the first time I've seen couples ditch one vehicle out here to get in another. So the question was, what caused the Morrisons to flee from where they'd set up shop? It certainly wasn't because they needed to use a bathroom. In my experience, people almost always flee due to fear, but fear of what? I scanned the area slowly with my flashlight. The Morrisons certainly spared no expense. The RV was top of the line, certainly a step up from sleeping in a tent. You don't leave equipment like this for no reason, especially if you're someone with money. A quick check revealed that none of the car's tires had been slashed and from all appearances it looked to be in good condition. Since the RV's front door was halfway open, I wasted no time in climbing the metal steps and peering inside. As expected, everything inside was top of the line. Most of it looked like they had just bought it at the store a week ago. I carefully climbed inside and with one hand on my gun, I slowly checked the bathroom and bedroom. The bathroom was a jumbled mess of tubes and bottles, and the bed was unmade, but everything was perfectly in order. Nor did it look like anything was stolen. 
I stepped back outside and started to walk towards my jeep to radio what I had seen. But when I was over halfway there, the skin on my arms prickled and I felt a chill run down my back. Despite the billowing humidity, I was chilled to the bone. I took a deep breath, carefully placed one hand back on my gun, and carefully walked the remaining distance, taking care to keep my back aligned with the RV as I had the sense I was being watched. I had felt this sensation before and you never get used to it, and just like dealing with grieving families, you shouldn't. Because if you do, the next grieving family may be yours. With paranoia and fear growing with each step, I mercifully made it to the jeep okay and slammed the door shut. Before I radioed back to the base, I leaned back in the driver's seat and tried to relax. As I took another deep breath and reminded myself to remain calm, I surveyed the terrain again. No car tracks aside from mine or the Morrisons, no evidence of a struggle, and no sign of any other life out here. But that didn't mean nothing else was out here besides me. As if to answer me, a guttural roar burst out from the woods to my right and I practically shot out of my seat. It was the ugliest sound I've ever heard and there was no way a human was capable of making that noise. It was the kind of sound that seems to be a living, breathing, physical entity, like thunder. Without waiting another moment, I started the engine, floored the gas pedal, and the jeep roared to life as I drove out of there as fast as I could. As I pulled away, I swear I could see the trees where the roar came from tremble slightly. It wasn't until I had been driving for about 10 minutes that I noticed some heavy breathing that sounded pained. When I realized it was mine, I tried to take a deep breath and calm down. Once I had done the former and was attempting the latter, I picked up my radio with a clammy hand and called in what I found and heard. I was surprised, as my voice was far calmer than I felt. On the other line, my colleagues sounded surprised but not skeptical. Maybe it was sincere. Or maybe when I had back up and we all headed back there together, we might find nothing, and they might just declare me paranoid. I didn't really care either way. I'd much rather be called paranoid than a crime statistic. I rolled along at a good pace until I rounded a corner and a figure standing in the middle of the road made me slam on the brakes. In the harsh light from the vehicle's headlights I could see the figure was slight, wearing badly tattered clothes, and was pretty beat up. But when the figure took a step forward, I couldn't believe it. It was my brother-in-law Jerry. Jerry, I rolled down my window in shock. What the hell is going on? Bobby. We got to go. Get in, I said before he ran unsteadily towards the passenger seat. The minute he sat down I hit the gas and we roared out of there. He panted for a good 30 seconds before his breathing evened out. What happened Jerry? I asked after he had a chance to rest. There's something out here Bobby. Some kind of creature. A monster. Like something out of a TV show. And there's this group of people that know about it and treat it like it's real important. They think it's so important they even kidnap people and offer it to the monster to eat. That's what happened to me. What kind of monster is it? It was the only thing I could think of to ask. I don't know. How did you get away? Remember that knife you got me for Christmas last year? The one you can store anywhere? That's right. I had it in my shoe at the time they grabbed me. Once I had a chance, I put it to good use. And here you are, saving my neck again. I'll never be able to repay you. His voice broke as he spoke. I always liked you, Jerry. Not like Tyler, Marianne's last boyfriend. The sentence was barely out of my mouth when the car went around a bend and I had to slam on the brakes again. But this time the sight was far more chilling, as the road was filled with people wearing identical monochromatic black plastic masks, the kind you get in bulk at a party store. They also wore plain black hooded sweatshirts with the hoods pulled up. No one moved an inch as I stopped. They all just stood there, facing me. All 25 of them. Then, almost on command, they all started walking at once towards my vehicle. That was the only cue I needed to start the car and run right through them. Or that was my plan before out of the corner of my eye, 
I saw a blur of color and two of the masked people went flying and slammed into trees. When they landed, both of them were sporting deep scratches that were bleeding. This made the others stop immediately before they started to flee in opposite directions. But that wasn't enough, because more of them fell prey to whatever was out there, which I couldn't see. Either way, I hit the gas harder than I ever had in my life, and it wasn't long before the screaming and wailing was a faint background noise. What's the matter? Jerry gleefully called out from the cracked window. Can't handle what you tried to do to me. The two of us didn't say a word to each other until we reached the park ranger station. Gathered around the front were a few of my colleagues, but two of the people were dressed casually and matched the description of the Morrisons whose campsite I was sent to check out. My face must have showed my surprise because Mrs. Morrison walked over to me and shook my hand. Libby Morrison, paranormal investigator. My husband and I were investigating the rumors of strange occurrences out here and we left the campsite abandoned in order to try to record what happened. Well congrats, you found something, was all I said before I briefly explained what happened and left it to the professionals. Altogether, the bodies of 10 masked people were pulled from the park. The rest were rounded up by law enforcement and charged with various things. And while that was going on, I handed in my resignation while Jerry went home with my sister. I eventually got another job related to the outdoors, but this time it was job related to outdoor retail. I wasn't sure where else to post these stories, so I figured I'd share them here. I've been an SAR officer for a few years now, and along the way I've seen some things that I think you guys will be interested in. I have a pretty good track record for finding missing people. Most of the time they just wander off the path, or slip down a small cliff, and they can't find their way back. The majority of them have heard the old stay where you are thing, and they don't wander far but I've had two cases where that didn't happen. Both bother me a lot, and I use them as motivation to search even harder on the missing persons cases I get called on. The first was a little boy who was out berry picking with his parents. He and his sister were together, and both of them went missing around the same time. Their parents lost sight of them for a few seconds, and in that time both the kids apparently wandered off. When their parents couldn't find them, they called us, and we came out to search the area. We found the daughter pretty quickly, and when we asked where her brother was, she told us that he'd been taken away by the bear man. She said he gave her berries and told her to stay quiet, that he wanted to play with her brother for a while. The last she saw of her brother, he was riding on the shoulders of the bear man and seemed calm. Of course, our first thought was abduction, but we never found a trace of another human being in that area. The little girl was also insistent that he wasn't a normal man, but that he was tall and covered in hair, like a bear, and that he had a weird face. We searched that area for weeks, it was one of the longest calls I've ever been on, but we never found a single trace of that kid. The other was a young woman who was out hiking with her mom and grandpa. According to the mother, her daughter had climbed up a tree to get a better view of the forest, and she'd never come back down. They waited at the base of the tree for hours, calling her name, before they called for help. Again, we searched everywhere, and we never found a trace of her. I have no idea where she could possibly have gone, because neither her mother or grandpa saw her come down. A few times, I've been out on my own searching with a canine, and they've tried to lead me straight up cliffs. Not hills, not even rock faces. Straight, sheer cliffs with no possible handholds. It's always baffling, and in those cases we usually find the person on the other side of the cliff, or miles away from where the canine has led us. I'm sure there's an explanation, but it's sort of strange. One particularly sad case involved the recovery of a body. A nine-year-old girl fell down an embankment and got impaled on a dead tree at the base. It was a complete freak accident, but I'll never forget the sound her mother made when we told her what had happened. She saw the body bag being loaded into the ambulance, and she let out the most haunting, heartbroken wail I've ever heard. It was like her whole life was crashing down around her, and a part of her had died with her daughter. 
I heard from another SAR officer that she killed herself a few weeks after it happened. She couldn't live with the loss of her daughter. I was teamed up with another SAR officer because we'd received reports of bears in the area. We were looking for a guy who hadn't come home from a climbing trip when he was supposed to, and we ended up having to do some serious climbing to get to where we figured he'd be. We found him trapped in a small crevasse with a broken leg. It was not pleasant. He'd been there for almost two days, and his leg was very obviously infected. We were able to get him into a chopper, and I heard from one of the EMTs that the guy was absolutely inconsolable. He kept talking about how he'd been doing fine, and when he'd gotten to the top, a man had been there. He said the guy had no climbing equipment, and he was wearing a parka and ski pants. He walked up to the guy, and when the guy turned around, he said he had no face. It was just blank. He freaked out, and ended up trying to get off the mountain too fast, which is why he'd fallen. He said he could hear the guy all night, climbing down the mountain and letting out these horrible muffled screams. That story bothered the hell out of me. I'm glad I wasn't there to hear it. One of the scariest things I've ever had happened to me involved the search for a young woman who'd gotten separated from her hiking group. We were out until late at night, because the dogs had picked up her scent. When we found her, she was curled up under a large rotted log. She was missing her shoes and pack, and she was clearly in shock. She didn't have any injuries, and we were able to get her to walk with us back to base ops. Along the way, she kept looking behind us and asking us why that big man with black eyes was following us. We couldn't see anyone, so we just wrote it off as some weird symptom of shock. But the closer we got to base, the more agitated this woman got. She kept asking me to tell him to stop making faces at her. At one point she stopped and turned around and started yelling into the forest, saying that she wanted him to leave her alone. She wasn't going to go with him, she said, and she wouldn't give us to him. We finally got her to keep moving, but we started hearing these weird noises coming from all around us. It was almost like coughing, but more rhythmic and deeper. It was almost insect-like, I don't really know how else to describe it. When we were within sight of base ops, the woman turns to me, and her eyes are about as wide as I can imagine a human could open them. She touches my shoulder and says he says to tell you to speed up. He doesn't like looking at the scar on your neck. I have a very small scar on the base of my neck, but it's mostly hidden under my collar, and I have no idea how this woman saw it. Right after she says it, I hear that weird coughing right in my ear, and I just about jumped out of my skin. I hustled her to ops, trying not to show how freaked out I was, but I have to say I was really happy when we left the area that night. This is the last one I'll tell, and it's probably the weirdest story I have. Now, I don't know if this is true in every SAR unit, but in mine, it's sort of an unspoken, regular thing we run into. You can try asking about it with other SAR officers, but even if they know what you're talking about, they probably won't say anything about it. We've been told not to talk about it by our superiors, and at this point we've all gotten so used to it that it doesn't even seem weird anymore. On just about every case where we're really far into the wilderness, I'm talking 30 or 40 miles, at some point we'll find a staircase in the middle of the woods. It's almost like if you took the stairs in your house, cut them out and put them in the forest. I asked about it the first time I saw some, and the other officer just told me not to worry about it, that it was normal. Everyone I asked said the same thing. I wanted to go check them out, but I was told, very emphatically, that I should never go near any of them. I just sort of ignore them now when I run into them because it happens so frequently. As far as missing persons go, I'd say about half the calls I get are related to that. The others are rescue calls, people who fall down cliffs and hurt themselves, that injured by fire, you wouldn't believe how often this happens, mostly drunk kids, get bitten or stung by animals or insects. We're a tight team, and we have veterans who are excellent at finding signs of lost people. That's what makes these cases where we never find any trace of them so frustrating. One in particular was upsetting for all of us, because we did find a trace of them, but it just led to more questions than answers. An older man had been hiking alone on a well-established trail, but his wife called to say that he hadn't come home when he should have. 
Apparently he had a history of seizures, and she was worried that he hadn't taken his medication and had suffered one out on the trail. Before you ask, I have no idea why he thought it was okay to go out alone, or why she didn't go with him. I don't ask about that kind of thing because past a certain point, it really doesn't matter. Someone is missing, and it's my job to find them. We went out in a standard search formation, and it wasn't long before one of our vets found signs that the guy had gone off the trail. We grouped up and followed him, spreading out in a fan to make sure we were covering as much ground as possible. Suddenly, a call comes over the radio telling us to all head back to the vet's location, and we come right away, because this usually means the missing person is injured, and we need a full team to help get them out safely. We meet back up, and the vet is just standing at the base of a tree with his hands on the sides of his head. I ask my buddy what's going on, and he points up into the branches of this tree. I almost couldn't believe what I was seeing, but there's a walking stick dangling from a branch at least 30 feet off the ground. The little strap thing on the handle has been looped around the branch, and it's just hanging there. There's no way the guy could have tossed it up that far, and we don't see any other signs that he's still in the area. We call up into the tree, but it's obvious no one's in it. We're all just sort of left scratching our heads. We keep searching for the guy, but we never find him. We even bring our canines out, but they lose his scent long before this tree. Eventually, the search is called off, because there are other calls we have to attend to, and past a certain point there's not much we can do. The guy's wife called us every day for months, asking if we'd found her husband, and it was heartbreaking to hear her get more and more hopeless each time. I'm not sure why this call in particular was so upsetting, but I think it was just the sheer improbability of it. That and the questions that were raised. How the hell had this guy's cane ended up there? Did someone kill him and toss that up there as some weird trophy? We did our best to find him, but it was almost like a taunt. We still talk about that one from time to time. Missing kids are the most heartbreaking. Doesn't matter what circumstances they go missing under, it's never easy, and we always, always dread the ones we find deceased. It's not common, but it does happen. David Polid talks a lot about kids' SAR teams find in places they shouldn't be, or couldn't be. I can honestly say I've heard about this kind of thing happening more than I've seen it, but I'll share one of the ones that I think about a lot that I witnessed personally. A mother and her three kids were out for a picnic in an area of the park that has a small lake. One is six, one is five, and the other is about three. She's watching them all really closely, and according to her, she never lets them out of her sight at any time. She never saw anyone else in the area either, which is important. She packs their stuff up and they start to head back to the parking area. Now, this lake is only about two miles into the woods, and it's on a very clearly established trail. It's almost impossible to get lost getting from the parking area to it, unless you're deliberately going off the path like an imbecile. Her kids are walking in front of her, when she hears what sounds like someone coming up the path behind her. She turns around, and in the four or so seconds she's not looking, her five-year-old son vanishes. She figures he stepped off the trail to pee or something, and she asks her other two where he went. They both tell her that a big man with a scary face came out of the woods next to them, took the kid's hand, and led him into the trees. The two remaining kids don't seem upset, in fact she says later that it seems like they've been drugged. They're sort of spacey and fuzzy. So of course, she freaks out, starts looking frantically in the area for her kid. She's screaming his name, and she says at one point she thinks she heard him answer her. Now obviously she can't go blindly running into the woods, she's got the other two kids, so she calls the police and they send us out immediately. We respond, and we start the search for him. Over the course of this search, which spans miles, we never find a single trace of the kid. Canines can't pick up any scent, we don't find any clothing or broken bushes or literally anything that would signify a child being there. Of course there's suspicion about the mother for a while, but it's pretty clear that she's completely destroyed by the whole thing. We looked for this kid for weeks, with a lot of volunteer help. But eventually, the search peters out, and we have to move on. The volunteers keep searching, 
though, and one day we get a call on the radio letting us know that a body has been found and needs to be recovered. They tell us the location, and none of us can believe it. We figure it has to be a different kid. But we go out there, about 15 miles from the site where he vanished, and sure enough, we find the body of the kid we've been looking for. I have been trying to figure out how this kid got where he did ever since we found him, and I've never come up with an answer. A volunteer just happened to be in the area, because he figured he might as well look in places no one else would think to on the off chance the body had been dumped. He comes to the base of a tall, rocky slope, and halfway up, he sees something. He looks through his binoculars, and sure enough, it's the body of a little boy stuffed in a little opening in the rock. He recognizes the color of the kid's shirt, so he knows right away that it's the missing boy. That's when he calls it in, and we're dispatched. It took us almost an hour to get his body down, and none of us could believe what we were seeing. Not only was this kid 15 miles from where he'd started, there was no possible way he could have gotten up there on his own. This slope is treacherous, and it's hard even for us with our climbing gear. A five-year-old boy had no way of getting up there, of that I'm certain. Not only that, but the kid doesn't have a scratch on him. His shoes are gone, but his feet aren't damaged or dirty. So it wasn't as if an animal dragged him up there. And from what we can tell, he hasn't been dead that long. He'd been out there over a month by that point, and it looked like he'd only been dead for, at most, a day or two. The whole thing was unbelievably strange, and was one of the most disconcerting calls I've ever been on. We found out later that the coroner determined the kid had died from exposure. He'd frozen to death, probably late at night two days before we found him. There were no suspects, and no answers. To date, it's one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. One of my first jobs as a trainee was a search op for a four-year-old kid that had gotten separated from his mom. This was one of those cases where we knew we were gonna find him because the dogs were on a strong scent trail, and we saw clear signs that he was in the area. We ended up finding him in a berry patch about half a mile from where he'd been last seen. Kid wasn't even aware that he'd wandered that far. One of the vets brought him back, which I was glad for because I'm really not good with kids, and I find it hard to talk to them and keep them company. As my trainer and I are headed back, she decides to take me on a detour to show me one of the hot spots where we tend to find missing people. It's a natural dip in the land near a popular trail, and people will usually move downhill because it's easier. We hike out there, it's a few miles away, and we get there in about an hour or so. As we're walking around the area and she's pointing out places she's found people in the past, I see something in the distance. Now, this area we're in is about 8 miles from the main parking area, though there's back roads you can take to get closer if you don't want to hike that far. But we're on state protected land, which means there can't be any kind of commercial or residential development out here. The most you'll ever see is a fire tower or makeshift shelter that homeless people think they can get away with building. But I can see from here that whatever this thing is has straight edges, and if there's one thing you learn quickly, it's that nature rarely makes straight lines. I point it out, but she doesn't say anything. She just hangs back and lets me wander over and check it out. I get within about 20 feet of it, and all the hair on the back of my neck stands up. It's a staircase. In the middle of the fucking woods. In the proper context, it would literally be the most benign thing ever. It's just a normal staircase, with beige carpet, and about 10 steps tall. But instead of being in a house, where it obviously should be, it's out here in the middle of the woods. The sides aren't carpeted, obviously, and I can see the wood it's made of. It's almost like a video game glitch, where the house has failed to load completely and the stairs are the only thing visible. I stand there, and it's like my brain is working overtime to try and make sense of what I'm seeing. My trainer comes and stands next to me, and she just stands there casually, looking at it as if it's the least interesting thing in the world. I ask her what the fuck this thing is doing here, and she just chuckles. Get used to it, rookie. You're gonna see a lot of them. I start to move closer, but she grabs my arm. Heart. I wouldn't do that. She says. Her voice is casual, but her grip is tight, and I just stand there looking at her. You are gonna see them all the time, but don't go near them. 
Don't touch them. Don't go up them. Just ignore them. I start to ask her about it, but something in the way she's looking at me tells me that it's best if I don't. We end up moving on, and the subject doesn't come up again for the rest of my training. She was right, though. I'd say about every fifth call I go on, I end up running across a set of stairs. Sometimes they're relatively close to the path, maybe within two or three miles. Sometimes they're 20, 30 miles out, literally in the middle of nowhere, and I only find them during the broadest searches or training weekends. They're usually in good condition, but sometimes it looks like they've been out there for miles. All different kinds, all different sizes. The biggest I ever saw looked like they came out of a turn-of-the-century mansion, and were at least 10 feet wide, with steps leading up at least 15 or 20 feet. I've tried talking about it with people, but they just give me the same response my trainer did. It's normal. Don't worry about it, they're not a big deal, but don't go close to them or up them. When trainees ask me about it now, I give them the same response. I don't really know what else to tell them. I'm really hoping someday I get a better answer, but it hasn't happened yet. This is another one that was less spooky and more sad. A young man went missing late in winter, when realistically no one should be going that far out onto the trails. We close a lot of them, but some remain open year-round, unless there's a shitload of snow. We did an op for him, but we had about six feet of snow on the ground, it was an unusually heavy snow year, and we knew it wasn't likely that we'd find him until spring when the thaw came. Sure enough, when the first big thaw came, a hiker reported a body a little ways off the main trail. We found him at the base of a tree, in a pile of melted snow. I knew right away what had happened, and it scared the living shit out of me. Most of you who ski or snowboard, or spend any amount of time on a mountain, will probably have guessed too. When snow falls, it doesn't collect as thick in the areas beneath the branches. It happens most with fir trees, because they have a sort of closed umbrella shape. So what you end up with is a space around the base of a tree that's filled with a mixture of loose, powdery snow, air, and branches. They're called tree wells, and they're not immediately obvious if you don't know what you're looking for. We put up signs in the welcome center, big ones, letting people know how dangerous they are, but every year that we get an unusual amount of snow, at least one person doesn't read them, or doesn't take the warning seriously, and we find out about it in spring. My best guess is that this young man was hiking and got tired, or maybe a cramp from walking in the deep snow. He went to go sit at the base of the tree, not knowing that there was a tree well, and fell in. He got stuck with his feet up, and the surrounding snow caved in around him. Unable to free himself, he suffocated. It's called snow immersion suffocation, and it doesn't usually happen except in really deep snow. But if you get stuck in a weird position, like this guy did, even six feet of snow can be lethal. What scared me the most was imagining how he must have struggled. Upside down, in the freezing cold, he didn't die quickly. The snow would have formed a dense, heavy pile on top of him, and it would have been literally impossible to get out. As it got harder to breathe, he would have known what was happening. I can't even imagine what he was thinking in his last moments. A lot of my less outdoorsy friends want to know if I've ever seen the goat man while I've been out on calls. Unfortunately, or I guess fortunately, I've never had anything quite like that happen. I guess the closest was the whole black eyed man thing, but I didn't see anything. However, there was one call where I had something kind of similar happen, but I'm not sure I'm willing to chalk it up to the goat man. We'd gotten a report that an older woman had fainted along one of the trails, and needed assistance getting back down to the main area. We hike up to where she's at, and her husband is just beside himself. He runs, well, I guess more jogs, to us, and tells us that he was a little ways off the trail looking at something when his wife starts screaming behind him. He runs back to her and she's passed out on the trail. We get her on a backboard, and as we're getting her down to the welcome center, she comes to and starts screaming again. I calm her down and ask her what happened. I can't remember verbatim what she said, but essentially, what happened was this, she'd been waiting for her husband when she started hearing this really strange sound. She said it sounded sort of like a cat, but it was off somehow, and she couldn't quite figure out why. 
She went a little ahead to try and hear it better, and it sounded like it was coming closer. She said the closer it got, the more uneasy she was, until she finally figured out what was wrong. I do remember this next part, because it was so weird that I don't think I could forget it if I tried. It wasn't a cat. It was a man, saying the word meow over and over. Just meow, meow, meow. But it wasn't a man, it couldn't have been, because I've never heard a man make his voice buzz like that. I thought my hearing aid was going out, but it wasn't, I adjusted it and it still sounded all buzzy. It was awful. He was coming closer, but I couldn't see him. And the closer he got the more scared I was, and the last thing I remember was a shape coming out of the trees. I guess that's when I fainted. Now, obviously I'm a little perplexed as to why a guy would be out in the woods chanting meow, meow at people. So once we get down the mountain, I tell my superior that I'm gonna go search the area to see if I can find anything. He gives me the go ahead, and I grab a radio and hike back to where she fainted. I don't see anyone, so I keep going about a mile more, and I when I head back I go off the trail, to see if I can figure out where she saw him coming from. It's almost sunset by this point, and I don't have any desire to be out at night alone, so I just sort of write it off and make a mental note to check it out again tomorrow. But as I'm headed back, I start to hear something in the distance. I stop, and I call out for anyone in the immediate area to identify themselves. The sound didn't come closer or get louder, but it sounded exactly like a man saying meow, meow in this really odd monotone. As comical as it makes it sound, it was almost like that guy on South Park with the electrolarynx, Ned. I go off the trail in the direction I think it's coming from, but I never seem to get closer. It's almost like it's coming from all directions. Eventually, it just sort of fades out, and I ended up going back to the welcome center. I didn't get any further reports like that, and even though I went back to that area, I never heard that exact sound again. I suppose it could have been some stupid kid out there messing with people, but even I have to admit it was weird. I'm not a ranger, but I do have a story about the woods out behind my house. I've only ever lived one place in my whole life. I lived with my family up on a mountain in rural Alabama. Like, really rural. Around our house you could walk two or three miles in any direction and not find any sign of civilization except for the road leading up to our house. Just trees, leaves, and pine straw. So just a three mile radius of private woodland. Anyway one night when I was probably about 15 or 16, I had a lady friend at my house who I desperately wanted to impress. So I decided it would be cool to go walk out to my favorite spot in the woods. In hindsight I know I shouldn't have done it but the spot was my ace and the whole light it was super romantic. Fireflies and the sound of a small stream the whole shebang. She seemed tentative at first because she was smart but ultimately caved to the thought of adventure. So we start walking down the path I had cut out. I've got my lantern because I couldn't find the flashlight so I couldn't really see too far out in front of me but it was enough to see the path. So it's about a 10 or 15 minute walk and about halfway through there was this kind of distant weird buzzing sound. It was hardly loud enough to interrupt our talking but it was definitely there whenever there was a break in talking. At first I really didn't think much of it. The woods can be a really loud place at night with all the bugs and it was getting to be spring. So I pretty much ignored it. Then after a bit of walking it was definitely getting to be more and more pronounced. Eventually my friend asked me if I heard it too and after I confirmed it she was adamant about turning around and just going back. I agreed just to make her comfortable but as we were going back the noise just kept getting louder, and eventually as we were almost back it was clear what the noise was. The sound of someone playing a harmonica had been gaining on us in the dark the whole way. By the end of it we were running pretty much full speed out of the woods across the yard and straight into the house. We went up to one of the windows facing the yard hit the light and cracked the windowsill to listen. It was still out there, playing its harmonica. And we listened to it pass the house and fade into the pines. By far the most surreal, horrifying experience of my life. Probably my most cherished memory too because that girl ended up being the one that got away.
Fall of 2017 I shot a deer right around dark about 5 miles out of my truck. I go back, get my gear off and grab my cart. I get to my deer, gut it quick and head out. Well about 2 miles in, my deer cart breaks. The wool snapped clean off. I had to sling on my back. About that time I heard some coyotes, I'd say 3 or 4, faintly on the gut pile. I go another mile before I take a break. I'm chilling there, listening to the yotes when it hits me like a hard tap on the nuts, they were much louder and many more yips than earlier. Within a quarter mile. And here I am sitting like a waffle with no weapon but a hatchet and gut knife sitting next to the second course of their feast. Now, of course, the first three miles from my stand consists of fairly easy walking. Dry, some thick spots but overall a easy walk. But the last two. Swampy is all hell and thicker than. I picked up, zigzagging through the swamp, running on adrenaline, not looking back as the easily dozen coyotes were about a 100 feet away. I never once stopped and never once looked back. On the home stretch I hopped the five foot gate with the deer on my back like it was nothing. Though I collapsed on the other side, nearly passing out. I heard the coyotes hit the fence within 10 seconds of my jump. They howled and snarled and screamed at me, who was clinching the knife ready to meet my maker, from the other side, and then just like that they were gone. The woods were silent and I hobbled back to my truck and grabbed the deer. I called my dad and told him my story and told him I was tired and was gonna take a nap in the parking lot. I was bloody as hell, scratches and cuts and bruises from branches hitting my exposed face. So, I took a nap, and was woken by a tapping noise on my window and then a bright light. I don't know who was more scared, me or the greenhorn DNR officer wide-eyed, slack-jawed, and baggy pants staring at the monstrosity I was. I told him the story, he checked my info and we had a good laugh and I went on my merry way. Now those who are going to ask why I didn't just drop my deer and let them have it, I don't know. It was only a five point, not very big. A very average deer. I'm just a stubborn ox who doesn't think things thoroughly. But hey, the deer was yummy. And for the DNR officer that I have a new brown set of undies too, I've seen him on three occasions since, all three eyes fishing. He calls me Wildman and doesn't even check my information nor does he check my fish. We talk quite a bit when we see each other. I consider him a friend actually. I kept seeing a light flash and a clicking sound around the property I was staying at for a few days. I thought it was weird, but assumed it was an animal sensor thing. The property was mostly surrounded by trees. With a light going off, also 5 to 10 seconds in between, I realized it was moving through the trees. I called out to the dog to bring her inside, and right after that, the light died. All I could hear was the clicking noise as I walked alongside the trees to the house. Okay, starting to get a bit concerned now, but I couldn't bolt for it. I felt like it was wise to avoid any sudden moves. So I walked to the door as normally as possible. The clicking sound behind me was somehow louder then. Got into the house and locked the door in two seconds. I was creeped out because I am partially deaf, meaning, I technically qualify for hearing aids but don't wear or need them ATM. If I was able to hear that sound, it indicates two possibilities, it was either a very loud and weird sensor, or it was much closer than I realized. Nothing else happened after that. Now I believe I let my imagination run too far. But in the moment, it was pretty creepy. I used to live in a very rural area in my youth and when I had just turned 18, I was helping with a family friend's security company. It was October, about 9 p.m. and we had just starting the night shift of patrolling what was once a manor house. A little backstory on this place, rumor had it that the house was cursed and haunted by demons and tortured souls alike. In the time it had been standing it had been a simple place of residence, 
hotel, hospital, nursing home and was eventually left abandoned and derelict in the late 60s. In the 40 years it was abandoned, it had been broken into by kids and gangs and had occasionally been set on fire, all wanting to see this curse for themselves or believed it enough to want the place gone. I didn't buy the whole haunting thing but the place certainly made me feel a little uneasy. Back to the story, it was dark, like it always is at that time at the end of October. It was also cold. And usually the lights around the garden kept it light enough that we could see what we were doing without the need for torches. That was when the lights went out. All of them. That was weird but not to worry, we had the flashlights on our phones. But our phone screens were flickering. Okay, that was super weird. And if it stopped there I probably would have gone home believing that there was some sort of issue with the electricity in and surrounding the house. Some areas are like that, especially in rural places, I live in a rural area now and all the lights blow out and flicker a lot because the electrics just aren't that great. I wish I could say it stopped there. We heard screeching coming from the house. It didn't even sound human. I can't even describe it but it was enough for your stomach to drop like the floor just collapsed beneath you and make your blood curdle. And for what must have been a solid 30 seconds the inhuman screeching was accompanied by unintelligible whispers closer to us and the occasional shadow depicting various acts of suicide and self-mutilation. When we all determined that we did indeed experience what had just happened we called the police about the disturbance and hightailed it out of there as soon as they arrived. No evidence of there being anyone in the house was found, no signs of a break-in, nothing. Our team of four people were the only people on the property. I haven't set foot in there since, however the other guys did and as far as I'm aware, they never had an incident like that since. I'm a native Alaskan who grew up in the sticks. Once I was out hunting with an uncle. Well, I was there anyways, I was eight at the time. We had been trying to find a small moose for quite some time that we'd seen take off into the forest across a field. Everything seemed normal, except that the area was very quiet. Then again, we're two humans walking about so we figured maybe the wildlife was just being cautious. Well, eventually we caught up to it, at another clearing and my uncle decided to take a shot as it was getting later and we needed to get it skinned, gutted and butchered before the sun went down. He hit it in the heart and it only managed to stumble maybe another 60 feet to the edge of the forest. I complimented his shot, and we grabbed our gear and walked over. Now, before I tell you this next part, keep in mind that moose are weighed in the thousands of pounds, generally. We're getting closer, and my uncle can't see the moose anymore. Weird, because we'd seen it fall, and we knew it had been hit mortally. We get to the location and the thing is just... Gone. My uncle starts to enter the forest and all my hair suddenly raised on my entire body and I made a whimper. I'm not a wuss, but I had a bad feeling. My uncle looks at me, annoyed and confused, and just maybe 30 feet away we hear heavy breathing. First thing we think is grizzly, so he pushes me behind himself and gets his gun ready and shouts as loud as he can. I don't know what it was, but it dropped the moose from at least a couple feet off the ground, we know because we heard the loud thud, and tears off running the other direction. It is dark in the understory so we don't see much, but my uncle decides the thing can have the moose. We weren't about to stick around to find out what could lift a whole moose into the air and carry it. Ten years as a USFS forest ranger here. A little late to this party, and not even sure where to start as a decade will leave you with countless stories. But I've nearly seen it all. A couple of my favorites both involve fire patrol during the summer months when we were enforcing fire restrictions. The first was a dude at a beautiful area, camped next to a lake. About 100 feet from his camp was a giant reflective yellow sign that read no camping or fires within half mile of the lake. When approached and asked if he'd seen the sign, he admitted that he saw it. Puzzled, I asked why he was camping there, and why he had a campfire. 
He replied that he figured he was half from the lake, so he should be fine. I kicked a stone into the water, and informed him that he was only about 10 feet from the lake, and I was going to need his ID, as I was going to issue him a citation. Another time, also on a late night fire patrol, we drove past a designated day use slash picnic area. This particular area had fire pits, benches, restrooms, water, it was well developed. Right outside the picnic area was this old trail that lead to a bridge site where the bridge was removed. Due to this we had placed a carsonite signpost, slender brown fiberglass post for informative stickers slash trail markers slash warnings. This particular post had stickers on it that said area closed slash no fires slash stay on designated trails and an American flag at the bottom. We roll up to a raging fire at this site. Fire so big and so close to the carsonite sign, that my stickers are literally bubbling and starting to melt due to the heat. Pretty angrily I asked who wanted to be responsible for this blatant violation. The oldest guy there says he'll take responsibility for the party, follows me to my truck and proceeds to give me his ID. In his police badge holder. He was a local police officer. I was floored. I gave him a stern lecture about reading signage and ultimately damaging government property. Endless stories though. Suicides, ATV accidents, bear attacks, very sad, far too many Boy Scout violations to count, poachers, murders, public nudity, sex in public, underage everything you can imagine, life flight helicopters, forest fires and air tankers, fire crews, enough said there. But all in all I truly miss the million acre office. The woods, the trees, animal encounters, the occasional well-informed forest visitors, and the endless views, vistas and sunsets. Getting paid to hike, mountain bike, dirt bike, motorcycles, snowmobile, jeep, and play outside for 10 years was clearly something I'll never forget. Back when we were about 14 my friends and I went up to stay at our buddy's family farm in rural New Hampshire. Not much up there besides farmland and miles of deep woods. It was around midnight, and we had just spent a few hours around, smoking cigars and building a bonfire up in one of the cow pastures. To get back to the house from the pasture, you needed to walk about half a mile through the woods and across another field, and the kid's dad had a tradition of messing with us on our way back. The usual routine was waiting on the porch and shooting Roman candles at us as we crossed the field. We started walking back, and as we emerged from the path, we started hearing loud rustling noises in the trees along the edge of the field about 70 yards away. We all ran into the middle of the field and hit the deck smiling, thinking my buddy's dad was about to start shooting fireworks at us. After about five minutes of the intermittent leaf rustling and no Roman candles, our smiles were gone and we started debating if it was a black bear or some other big animal. The rustling was distinctly the sound of footsteps, and would pick up and suddenly stop as if someone was running tree to tree. Truly freaked out, my buddy pulls out his cell phone and calls the landline at his house. He stands up and walks a little in the direction of the house while my other friend and I stay laying down, staring in the direction of the noises. Suddenly, something runs out of the tree line. I will never forget this image for as long as I live. We were still about 50 yards away and there was only a crescent moon out so there wasn't much light to make out fine details, but we watched as this inhumanly tall thing strode across a portion of the field and then back into the trees. It was skinny, with disproportionately long limbs and in the dark appeared to be a solid light gray slash white color. As it ran, its incredibly long arms and legs swung in this disturbingly unusual way, and it appeared to be moving much faster than it should have been. As fast as it had appeared, it was gone back into the forest. My friend and I looked at each other in silent horror. We stand up, ready to book it back to the house. My other friend walks back over to us, oblivious to what we just saw. His dad picked up. He said he's been in bed for an hour. Without saying anything, me and my friend who witnessed it started sprinting for our lives back to the house. 
The other friend follows suit. We make it back, lock all the doors and recount what we saw to the other friend and his dad. None of us slept that night. When we went downstairs in the morning, my friend's dad, whose bedroom was on the ground floor, tells us how throughout the night he heard something banging on the side of the house and windows, and claimed he went out several times with his shotgun to find nothing. We thought he was just messing with us at the time, but to this day he stands by that story. As someone who doesn't believe in the paranormal, it's not a story I tell often, but the two friends who were there and I still talk about regularly and it scares the S out of us. Just this year, I shared it with another buddy of mine who loves that type of stuff, and after a quick Google search he shows me something that refers to a devil. When I saw it I nearly defecated my pants. The description and depiction of this creature from local folklore matched what I saw perfectly. I honestly don't know what to believe, but I know what I saw, and it's safe to say you're never going to catch me in the NH woods past sunset again. Bonus creepiness, the stretch of forest adjacent to his family's farm has been known locally as Boneswood and Devilswood for as long as his family has lived in the area, several generations. So we're at this camper near the Dover Lights in Arkansas. It's not the fanciest campsite but we managed to find this guy that spent a lot of time out there, as much as legally allowed, while also working, and apparently making a lot of cash, so he just vacations in the woods half the year. The guy offers to let my friend watch the place while he goes to visit his son. My friend automatically invites me and some other people to come hang out and we spend a few days there drinking, smoking, fishing, and screwing around. All in all pretty okay, until my female friend gets super drunk and barges outside in the middle of the night buck naked to eat beans by the handful out of a cold pot. As someone who admires cleanliness I follow her out and try to make sure she doesn't hurt herself while everyone else just laughs. So there she is covered in beans and I'm trying to convince her to settle down and clean herself off with a towel when suddenly her head shoots up like a deer in headlights. She just glares at the trees around us, we're alone and it's pitch black, before literally growling and then sprinting into the woods. I have no idea what to do. I've completely lost sight of her and she's naked in the woods by herself. A few failed attempts to call out to her and I do the stupidest thing I could have done by following her. About 5 meters into complete darkness I look down and see a faint light from someone's phone. Picking it up I see it's in camera mode and there are pictures of us, very recent pictures, all in creepy night vision mode, with some looking like they were taken from the window of the camper, and the last one is of my friend running directly towards the camera. Realizing what happened I delete the pictures and drop the phone on a rock, crushing the screen with my foot. Still unable to find her and freaking out I double back to the camper for help only to find her still very drunk in a lawn chair naked. Carrying her back inside I let her BF towel her off and they both pass out spooning on the bottom bunk. I never told them what really happened and she didn't remember in the morning. But I did lock the door and wake up every hour just to keep an eye on things. I was with a trail ranger following a search of marsh land that was next to a national park. Backstory, we were on vacation from the UK where I was working at the time and we had basically had to go out to a company outing around Christmas time as it was when we started to party, work day off, entire company from the US offices was there. We had noticed one member of the team got drunk and basically wandered off somewhere. So we had to call rangers to find him. Luckily we were being guided by a trail ranger. Before anyone says anything, getting really drunk in a national park is never a good idea. Most of us had one or two beers and that was it. This guy couldn't really handle his drink and also had way too much of the blue can stuff people nicknamed Redneck's Finest, not sure of the particular beer, more suited to European beers and pint glasses rather than this canned stuff. We didn't find him for a while to the point it got dark, like really dark. So we had to get flashlights looking for the guy. After searching many hours, we managed to get a search team together. 
After several hours it felt like someone was following me, alone, in a national forest with only a mobile to contact us, so basically I got lost looking for the guy. Panic started to set in because I didn't know where the trail ranger had went a few miles beforehand. So alone, no idea where I was in marshland, walking on soil, a few tall trees in the distance. Along the way I hear what sounds like footsteps, muddy, like someone was walking behind me in the marsh. Turn the flashlight to face the noise, it stops. Continue walking. Hear it again, stop, turn around, point flashlight, it stops. Start to get really nervous. Happens again, get a sudden sense of dread, so shoot off running. Manage to reach the trees in the distance, heart pounding. I run into the guy we were searching for, along with the trail ranger, saying he had managed to track him. Told him what happened to me, told me that the place in the marsh was infested with alligators and that's the sound they make when they creep up on people. Says I was either very brave or very stupid to walk there because people have been grabbed by them before. We managed to make it back to the hotel with the guy slurring his words and still very drunk. Park ranger congratulates me on my balls to brave marshland, in reality I didn't know and wouldn't have went there if I had known. Still think about how differently it might have ended if I had known about the alligators. The noise is there when they creep up on you, but when alligators see flashlights they sometimes stop in the dark. Never knew that. Apparently a thing. There's some mountains behind a small town near where I used to work in the Arizona desert. One night, a good friend of mine and I decided to say screw it and actually hike up the mountain after work. Since I used to work mid-shift, this takes place at like 1 in the morning, I know, I'm an idiot. Anyway, we stay up there and have a real bro-to-bro -bro conversation about the past. While he's telling me about his ex, I swear, even to this day, I heard someone whisper right into my ear. I asked him if he had whispered anything, and he declined. I just shook it off as weird. About an hour later, he interrupts me and has me turn around. I see nothing. I look back and ask him, what? He said he saw what looked like an orange fuzzy ball that moved quickly before disappearing. This really freaked him out but even with my previous whisper experience, I thought it was just mother nature playing games. Anyway, we finally decide that it's time to go, and just as we got to my truck is when things got super weird. I sit down, open the passenger side door for my friend, and I see what I can only describe as an orange fuzzy ball floating very quickly to the left. It disappeared once it got behind my friend. At the same time I witnessed this, my friend, who is an emotionally tough guy, begins screaming his lungs out. He literally hops into my truck, and tells me to get out of there. I tell him about the fuzzy ball once we leave and he just goes, huh. He then goes on to tell me that after I opened the door, he looked down and saw, and I quote, shadowy dog-like legs underneath the truck, as if it was laying down. We both nervously chuckle it off, and that's when I notice the time. 3.14 AM. The witching hour had just passed. I never believed in it beforehand, but that experience has made me rethink it. I was with my girlfriend in upstate New York in New Windsor I think. Really small trail, probably 45 minutes to complete the whole thing. But ran into some real creeps towards the end. In the middle of the trail there's this watchtower you can climb in above the tree line. My girlfriend and I climb it and spend about 10 minutes up there. Then we hear some footsteps on the ladder. I look down, and there are two young men climbing up with machetes slung across their back. I don't panic but my girlfriend starts freaking out. We are completely alone in the middle of this trail, just us two and our new visitors. Now, the watchtower viewing area at the top is maybe 20 square feet, so not a whole lot of room for four people. So I have my girlfriend standing behind me while these two guys come up and are acting all casual. 
Not a word is said for a couple minutes as these two young guys are just casually looking out above the tree line. I decide to break the silence and ask them what they're doing out here, and one of them says, we come out here pretty often looking for people. His tone was trying to be intimidating but I could just tell that it was somewhat fake. Either these two guys were just trying to scare us, or they were toying with us. I replied with a joke, oh, you must have hid the bodies really well. And everyone except my girlfriend who is still behind me laughs. We spend a few more minutes up there. I am getting pretty nervous because no words are being said. All I'm doing is watching their hands to see if they make a move for their machete. Then, they both make their way down the watchtower. Not a goodbye. Nothing. My girlfriend and I watch them run off of the trails into the woods. We discuss how weird it was. And how they were just trying to scare us. We decide that we are going to climb down and sprint our way to the car. We wound up getting to the car and getting out of there. As we are driving, my girlfriend tells me that she actually knew one of the kids they went to the same high school. I was about 20 at the time she was 22. She tells me how he was one of those kids that was weird and got bullied in school and all those great attributes that you hope to see in a guy with a machete in the middle of the woods. And how my girlfriend was one of the people who bullied him. I was a cadet weekend six or so years ago at Thetford Training Ground, East Anglia, UK. It has been a training ground for a good century and a bit so. Lots of history to the area however haven't found much evidence of any notable haunting in the area. Had a really good time but a few slightly weird things happened which no one was able to explain. No large native animals other than the odd fox or badger but they tend to steer generally clear due to the nature of the exercises, military so involve gunfire. Quite diverse landscape for England with open spaces, pine trees, with large open clearings, shrubs dotted across the place etc. Five of us cadets were on patrol through the pine tree covered areas on the outskirts of a big, plain clearing, around 3 square km. Only distinguishable feature was a large mound in the middle of this clearing. Anyway one of us shouts a stand to in an excitement and slight confusion as to what he could have seen we all eagerly take a position. Laid pointing my rifle in same general direction as everyone else looking for the threat. Co then tells us how he saw a figure on top of the mound and that it was probably the sergeant testing us. So we vigilantly go over low and behold there is no one. Remember then Ko who was only 16 I was about 13 at the time being very creeped out. 13 year old me was slightly amused but mainly just ecstatic at being out in the woods, no adults and with rifles, no magazines though, ah. Could he have been messing with us? Of course, but something tells me he probably wasn't. Later on we set up camp in a lightly forested area and get on sentry duties. I took one of the first watches and felt very creeped out, as if I was being watched. I had my rifle with me giving me a weird sense of confidence so brushed it off and lay there for a few hours. Later on in the night another sentry orders a stand to and we all hear rustling in the bushes, pretty loud and we're all a little spooked. The adults go and investigate and come back telling us it's a rogue sheep from a nearby farm haha. -ha. Anyway fast forward to the bus back and they tell us they never found the exact cause of this noise but didn't want to scare us by admitting that last night. One of the adults also told me later she's always found that ground creepy. This woman is pretty nails and never appeared to be scared by much but admitted that she once was walking back to camp at night and swore she was being followed by footsteps that stopped when hers did. She really never took any jokes well and did not have much of a sense of humor but still, maybe she was messing with us all along and this was an elaborate prank. However she was not the sort to do this haha -ha, not essentially too creepy but still slightly out of the norm. Not a park ranger, but my inexplicable story is probably explicable but I've never found out the answer and I've asked. I was camping in a campground on the west coast. 
I have back problems, so when I camp I sleep in the car. I had the back seat converted to a bench seat and put my sleeping bag there. I cover the car windows for privacy. Early one morning I hear this rumbling sound. It's loud enough to wake me up. I'm a child of the suburbs and what it really sounds like is when you push a shopping cart across a really rough parking lot, one with a lot of gravel sticking out of the concrete. Then the car gets bumped, hard. The whole car moved. I immediately start unzipping the sleeping bag with the inside zipper, but that's not the quickest process. By the time I get free enough to sit up and look there's nothing there. But some big animal had walked by and I love to know what makes a rumbling noise like that. I lived on the outskirts of a national park in a cabin. It was a four mile drive from the main road just to get to the property, and we had no plumbing or power. This property was right next to where the park started, to call it the middle of nowhere is an understatement. My roommate at the time was interning with the park service, but he is a city kid. Every evening at the dead of night I had been hearing noises in the woods, what I thought was someone walking. But then they just stop in particularly overgrown areas of the jungle, so your mind starts to doubt itself. Is it a pig? A cat? Is it just the wind? The cabin didn't have a locking door, and the owners didn't want me to install one, so I began sleeping in my car. Now, this is a huge property, and I'd park my car over an acre away from the cabin and where I was hearing something. I started hearing those footsteps again. I moved out, my roommate, who thought I was bonkers, stayed and still slept there without a locking door. He got robbed, not once, but twice after I moved out. So he finally put up motion triggered cameras. There was a man with a long rifle who'd hike up to the property, set up in the bushes, and watch us. Back in 2010 I had just finished a wilderness leadership class and decided to go to Colorado to get some solo wilderness time. I found out about some hot springs near the Colorado River that were only accessible during the winter, during the summer the snow melt raises the water level of the river and they become submerged, and decided to go spend a few weeks out there. It was on BLM land and I had about a 4 mile hike from where I parked to where I was camping. The BLM lady who watched the land saw me when I arrived and asked me to just write the date on my windshield every week to let her know I'm still alive out there. Anyways, it was pretty pleasant out there, but every night I was terrified of the bears, they should be sleeping, but if they aren't it means they are hungry and I'm for dinner. For this reason I decided to set up camp close to a cliff. It was about 40 down to the river and I figured, Worst case scenario I could jump and then get to the hot springs to prevent hyperthermia. It's a crazy plan, but once you're out there you realize bear spray is kinda useless inside the tent. So one early morning I hear these loud animal noises outside my tent. They are getting closer and very loud, accompanied by grunting and breathing noises. I was too scared to open my tent, I just froze. And the steps kept getting closer and closer and closer. At this point I could hear it sniffing my tent. I don't dare move, I just lay there. It starts to move away from my tent but it's still out there, and now I hear more than one animal. I finally poke my head out, and it's a herd of elk. I swear though. It was probably the most scared I've ever been out camping. I used to be in a group that's somewhat like the scouts so we spent a lot of time in the woods and some weird thing happened often but most of the time it was easy to explain. One thing happened though that to this day scares the living s out of me. I was a leader for the age group 8 to 10 years old and we were out on a camping trip. It was the first year we stayed on that terrain and it was huge, normally we tend to explore the majority of a terrain before the kids arrive so we were aware of any possible dangerous spots to avoid this time it was impossible every camp we have what we call a night game 
It's usually a scary game in which the kids have to complete several tasks while the leaders scare the ever-loving s out of them. Obviously we had one two during that camp, we masked up as monsters and hid out in the woods close to the checkpoints they had to pass. While running in between checkpoints I found an open stretch of forest with little to no foliage so it was ideal for chasing after them. There was no real room to hide besides behind trees so I couldn't use my flashlight or they'd be able to see me from miles away. It was dark, like the unsettling kind of dark that plays tricks on your eyes and you start imagining things that aren't real. During my stay there I saw a shadow that was around my size running past me a few times, I couldn't see it very well so I just assumed I was imagining things because nothing was there when I turned my flashlight on. The game was nearing its end and I saw the shadow again, this time I could see it vaguely standing near a tree not too far away from me. I thought it was one of the other leaders hiding to scare kids and decided to go over there as it was about time to go back. I aimed my flashlight towards the tree and while getting closer I noticed that there was indeed someone standing there dressed in what looked like a torn burlap sack and had their head covered with a few white plastic bags that looked like they were tied together. I started to feel pure dread, something felt really off. I asked if everything was okay but they didn't respond. The only thing I heard was this weird sound that sounded like someone knocking on wood. Nevertheless I went a bit closer until I was about 10 meters away from this person. The knocking sound turned out to be that person smacking his head repeatedly into the tree and I noticed he looked like a male. He was barefoot and his arms and legs were covered with crusted mud, his hands were in a weird cramped position. I was convinced this was just one of the other leaders pulling a prank so I told them to knock it off. He slowly turned his head and started walking towards me. Something inside me just told me to run, it didn't matter if it was a just a stupid prank and I ran away scared for nothing. If this wasn't a prank it felt like I was in serious danger so I ran as fast as I could. I heard him running after me but I didn't want to turn around to look as I'd probably run into a tree. I arrived back at the campsite and every single person that could be dressed like that was already there, they couldn't have gotten there before me and if they did they sure as hell didn't have the time to change into their regular clothes. Still, I told them and that they gave me a good scare with that. They just looked weird at me, thinking I was trying to scare them and we left it at that. Next day I wanted to go check it out, who knows maybe some weirdo ate the wrong mushroom and might be out there dying from hypothermia. I took someone else with me just in case and there was nothing but endless trees. We arrived at the tree where I saw the person banging his head and there was a dead, skinned, decomposing rabbit nailed to the tree. We called the cops, they looked around quickly and brushed it off as just a prank from another scouting group or some kids from the nearby town and left it at that. We didn't notice anything weird after that so it probably was a dumb prank, but seriously some people have a sick up sense of humor. Not a ranger but I was out camping with my dog one night in and along the Mogollone Rim of Arizona. It was dark and we were sitting around the campfire when we hear something behind a bush close to our camp. Instead of my dog barking at it, he begins to whimper. I didn't think nothing of it and just tended to the fire. After a couple of minutes we were some more noises from a different bush. This time my dog gets up and goes over to the tent and scratches the door because he wants to go in. I toss a couple of rocks in the direction I heard the noise and nothing happened. I'm spooked now so I toss a couple of pieces of wood on the fire and climb into my tent with my dog hoping that the light from the fire would keep whatever was out there away. We eventually fall asleep and luckily had no other disturbances during the night. The next morning, I go out behind the bushes where we had heard the noises and found mountain lion tracks that were circling around our camp. I'm sure glad I didn't go looking at night when I heard the noises. When I went backpacking at Philmont, Boy Scout Place, 
Every crew started out with a ranger that went out with the crew for the first couple of days just to make sure that they were going to be okay and had the necessary skills to get to their destinations. After they left the cruise they would head to the nearest staff camp or pickup location. Our ranger was telling us about one of his hikes back after leaving a crew. He followed along a game trail since they are usually easy ways to get through the woods and as he was walking a mountain lion walked up behind him and then scented him like a house cat does by rubbing against your legs. When a mountain lion does that apparently you involuntarily defecate and urinate in your pants and then hope to god the lion was just in a playful mood. As it turned out this one was indeed just screwing with him and he made it safely back to camp. I was the lone recreation ranger in a small district in southern Idaho. Nearest town from guard station was about an 1.5 hours away by car. After moving into the guard station, solar power was not working, and I hadn't slept for about a month due to various factors, bats in the cabin, something walking on the deck at night. The woods there always had an eerie feeling to them, unlike the southwest Ponderosa forest that I was used to. About two months into the seasonal job, I started to hear something walking and scratching on the deck at night, perhaps even on the door. Now this district was known for its badgers and beavers, so I didn't think much of it. When leaving the cabin at night, I always had an eerie feeling like I was being watched. One night, I was returning from my grocery run, always went on Tuesday nights, and I had a bad feeling. At the time, I did not have my shotgun in the vehicle. After stepping out of the vehicle, I looked to the right of the cabin, about 50 feet from my front door. All I could see were two eyes about 3.5 to 4 feet in the air. To say I freaked out was an understatement. I started yelling get out of here but the eyes only crouched down, and inched closer. At this point I could tell it was a large animal of some kind, definitely not a coyote. I tossed a piece of firewood in the general area and the creature leapt back a bit but did not make a sound. Tossed four or five more pieces and creature still inched forward. At this point I fumbled with the keys, of course the solar power was out again. I managed to get inside and grabbed my shotgun, technically, you are not supposed to have guns in gov housing, but who lives in the hills have eyes back country and does not carry. Went outside creature was bit closer. Still could not get a good look with my bad headlamp. Loaded shotgun and continued to throw pieces of wood with one hand. Finally the creature walked back into the brush. That night, I drank about four IPAs and slept with my shotgun. In the morning, trail crew came up and we found mountain lion tracks all over the porch, rocking bench, and compound leading back to the creek. After that event, I always heard the rocking chair move and someone or something walking on the porch, but never found any tracks after that point. Considering that it was always muddy up there it was weird to not find any tracks. I've been stalked by mountain lions before and never had that eerie feeling like I did in those woods. I was in the Gila wilderness and a convoy of us campers slash fishers were making the drive on the dirt road from Mogalone to Snow Lake when we spotted a forest ranger guy pulled over looking in a ditch. Turns out some idiot tried to make a U-turn and didn't realize the loose rock makes it hard to stop, they went over the edge and high centered. We're miles from the nearest official campground and it's early spring and the night time gets pretty damn cold. We get a jeep with a winch in position and start to pull the guy out of the ditch. Off a hill comes a white dude in a purple velvet sweatsuit. He's got a walking stick, fanny pack and the purple velvet sweatsuit, that's it. He's a blonde dude and pretty skinny. He comes up to us and he tells us he's German and having a great time. We could not get over the purple velvet suit, it was like a real pimp sweatsuit. The ranger is immediately suspicious wants to know where she's staying and where he came from. It was around 9 o'clock in the morning and the only way he could have gotten where he came from was to hike for hours. The German guys is a goofy and just points off toward the other mountain when asked where he's staying slash going. 
We all think it's funny, but also question how the guy is getting along with no water and no food. The sun is intense above 5,000 feet even if it's only 75 degrees. The German guy refuses water or any other help and just crosses the road goes off into the woods. The ranger told us he can't really keep the guy from doing that since he seemed okay. He said he'd check a few campsites in that direction later to see if he made it. We get to Snow Lake and commence drinking like fish in order to better catch fish. That evening the ranger pops by to tell us that nobody at any other camp had seen the dude. He radioed around and no other rangers had abandoned camps or missing campers and they surely hadn't seen a German dude in purple pimp sweatsuit. That range rolled off duty the next day and his replacement came by to make sure the other ranger was smoking something we gave him. We assured him it all happened. Never heard another word about the German in the purple pimp sweatsuit, but makes for a good story. German tourists are different. I was doing some stuff in Death Valley NP a couple of summers ago and left via the opposite direction of the construction crew. So this is a second-hand story, as we were all leaving after a very long night of pouring concrete. They should have been done at around sunrise, but things didn't finish up until like 1 p.m. or so. The archaeologist, let's call him Art, saw a faint glimmer of silver in a bush. Thinking that it was an old balloon, a huge problem don't release balloons, they always come down somewhere and end up as litter, he turned around to retrieve it. Instead he found a German man sitting there under car windshield sunscreen thing with a piece of rolling luggage by his side. This was an area that was closed off to the public until the road was repaired and nobody would be back through until the next day, so he stopped to talk to the man. Apparently, the German man, Klaus is a good German name, let's use that, had been dropped off by his wife and mother-in-law the afternoon before and was in the middle of a long hike, like 20 to 30 miles or so. He had been hiking all night and was taking a break to rest during the day. There were plans to meet up in a day or two, but the women were in Vegas at the casinos. After some discussion, Art learned that Claus had no food or supplies and had only drank a few sips from one of his three half-liter water bottles since he began the trek, He thought rationing it would be best since he only had a small amount of water. The temperature was already in the 120F range and Art had to explain that the guy could not stay there, or he would very literally die. Claus said that he would be fine because he trained by sitting in a sauna a number of times before he left Germany, plus, how would his wife know where to pick him up if they left? After explaining the difference between sitting in a sauna and hiking with no food in a dry desert, Art proceeded to question what would happen if his wife's car broke down or if she got delayed for some reason. There is no phone service in that part of the park and nobody was supposed to be in the area to begin with, so Claus would be Saul if his wife didn't arrive. Claus finally agreed to jump into Art's truck and drive to the nearby town greater than 20 miles away. As soon as he got into the AC of the truck and took a few sips of cool water, Claus realized how hot his body actually was and that he was actually in pretty bad shape. When they got to the town they actually Claus wife and mother-in-law in the parking lot of the only gas station. It turns out that they had broken down there and never made it to Vegas. After talking a little, Art had to get off to sleep, he had been up all night, and reminded Claus to grab his roller suitcase from the back of the truck. Art casually asked what was inside and Claus opened it to reveal a suitcase full of water bottles. Claus was so delirious from heat that he forgot the heavy bag that he had somehow been rolling across the desert was full of water. Delirium like that is a sign of sunstroke, Claus probably wouldn't have made it through the rest of the day had Art not insisted on him getting into the truck. This was around 2015 when I went on a day hike at a Mount GB, somewhere in the southern part of Luzon area. The week prior to my hike, I was in the same area with a friend. Being that the trail is relatively straightforward, we decided not to hire a guide. Fast forward to the present, I decided to do a nighttime trek with five of my colleagues in tow. 
Since I was the one who knew the trail, I was the group leader. About an hour or so, we heard something that went, PSSST, 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 as we were hiking the trail. We looked around, thinking it might be one of the locals, some parts of the trail led to small houses. Anyway, it soon stopped, so we forgot all about it. We soon reached a narrow part of the trail bordered by shallow cliffs on either side. Since I was the lead, I was very focused on the trail, and I didn't notice that my colleagues were lagging behind until one of them said, Hey, why don't you shine your flashlight right in front of you? I stopped walking and waited for them to catch up. When we reached the campsite, I asked my colleague why he told me to shine the flashlight right in front of myself. Well, he whispered, you were walking so fast I didn't think you saw the child standing right in front of you. Me and my two other friends were walking on our way home from the summit of a Mount B, also in southern Luzon, when a kid came to us asking if he can guide us for five paces only. He was dressed with a blue checkered shirt and a white pants. He was very well groomed, his clothes were wrinkle free and his hair wasn't even messy at all. We knew the trail by heart, so we kept on declining his offer. Eventually we agreed, since we figured he would follow us anyway. When we started to walk again he suddenly stopped following us. I called out to him, but he didn't mind me. He just stood still. I looked at my companions and they were very scared. So I said, okay, stay there if you want, but you won't get your five pesos. And left. Now I told this story to fellow mountaineers and they told me the kid was probably a child of one of the guides. This is a very popular urban legend surrounding a certain Mount C, also called the Devil's Mountain. The famous legend narrates the story of a couple who went on a hike in Mount C at midnight. They got lost when they accidentally took an unusual trail on their way to campsite. Even if the weather is threatening because of a storm and there was zero visibility, they still continued their hike. They arrived in a point where the trail forked and they turned left when they should have turned right. The left was a deadly trail, thus they never made it to campsite. According to local folks, the two were not found until now. This story is connected to the previous one, also taking place in Mount C. A group of hikers, together with a guide, went on a rarely used trail. On the way they passed by a small village, where the elders advised them to continue the trek but leave the only girl in the group at the village. They politely declined and continued hiking. Halfway through, the guide told them that he could only go as far as the first half. Being experienced hikers, they paid the guide and continued until they came to a fork in the road. As they were debating which road to take, a couple stumbled upon them and told them to take the left side. They continued following the couple even as it got dark and started to rain. Suddenly, their flashlights turned off simultaneously, but they still tried to follow the couple. When the rain stopped and their flashlights came back on, the couple was gone, and one of the group members slipped and almost fell from a ravine. Not a ranger but my uncle was. He always told the story of when he worked in Montana he was a solid 5 to 10 miles away from town so pretty much balls deep in the woods. He recalled pulling his ATV on top of a semi-big hill that overlooked a valley, in between all the trees there was this clearing he could see through his binoculars, through them he saw an older lady, 60 plus ish, in black surrounded by a 6 to 8 wolves. Now, he is a lengthy distance from the woman but he starts yelling and honking and all that and takes off down the hill as fast as he could but when he reached the clearing there was no one there. No wolves, no woman, only a silver ring with a black stone in the middle. He still has it to this day. I have been a ranger in the USFS for almost 15 years, but this takes place about three years after I joined. We were getting calls about a lone wolf with a collar on hanging around campsites weird, since wolves aren't known to be in the area but when you work in the field long enough you start to realize anything is possible. No calls had mentioned violent behavior from the animal, thank God. 
I departed from the station around noon to check out the places that it had been sighted. Wandered around for about three hours, no further calls during that time, until I took a break for water. Sat down, had a snack, drank some water and was getting ready to go again when the thing was about 20 feet out, trotting near the tree line. It seemed friendly and had the collar, so I whistled to it and he came over to me. Getting a closer look, I could see it wasn't a wolf. It was huge, but it was dark and didn't have the right body structure, though I could see why it'd be confusing from a distance. I radioed in and reported that I had the dog with me, but as soon as I said I'd bring it in, the dog took off. Like he was playing, to see how far he could get me to chase him, typical dog behavior, I went after it, and I swear it was a game of chase for at least five minutes as we steadily ran through the forest. Please don't go running through woods unless you know the area like the back of your hand. The dog finally slowed down near a rock bed slash creek area, and started pacing around a spot. I drew closer and didn't see anything off at first, then I noticed it, the overgrowth had almost disguised what appeared to be bones. I called it in immediately, and another team was sent to recover the remains. When I went to retrieve the dog, he was just gone. But, honestly, it wasn't a priority at that point. He was friendly enough, and I figured we'd catch up with him later. The bones were identified as a teenage male's, died by a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. He'd been reported missing in the area long before I became a ranger, and there'd been pretty much no hope of finding him. I spoke to his mom on the phone, she called to thank me personally, and she asked how I'd found her son. I mentioned the black dog, then thought I'd said something wrong since there was a pause on her side of the line. After I gave a couple details about the dog, she quietly explained that her son, who struggled with making connections, had sunken into a deep depression after the death of his best friend, the very dog that led me to him. I think I spent the rest of the day stunned. I continue to be in disbelief, in a way. But I know what happened. Back in the early 90s my brothers and I were staying with my cousin and her husband, who I'll call Scott, who was a DNR officer. This was opening day of deer, bow, season in northern Michigan. While I was at least a mile from any road or trail I stumbled across an area that looked like people had been camping recently, they'd even built this weird outdoor kitchen. Being a naive 16 to 17 year old the kitchen confused me but I figured they had left because hunting season had started so I just continued on my way. That night I was telling everyone about it when Scott gets serious and asks me about what it looked like and where it was. After I told him he warned me not to go back there and to be glad no one was there. Apparently some locals had multiple locations like that where they would cook meth so they wouldn't blow up their houses and to make it harder to get caught. I guess Scott reported it to the cops and they raided it a couple days later. I must have missed it, but the guys had set up multiple trail cams, which were damn expensive at that time, all around the area. Based on the pics on them, I missed the guys by a few hours. They were heavily armed while I only had a bow and a knife. On the surface it seems like a well thought out plan from some smart people, but they weren't very smart after all. Scott filled us in later on some details. Apparently they didn't clear the images off the cameras before leaving. The images, though too low of a resolution to recognize their faces, showed them not only cooking the meth, but also carrying illegal guns and riding off on customized four-wheelers known to everyone in the area. They ended up getting 20 years in prison. I have a friend who is a trail ranger. Basically a ranger who can't get you in trouble. He told me about this time he was gathering illegally placed wildlife cameras and knocking down hunting stands, feeders, and blinds with another actual ranger. The other ranger wasn't feeling well so he said he was going to head back as it's a one hour ATV ride. Friend finished up the last one when he heard voices. Keep in mind he's far off the beaten path. He called out and no one replied. As it was getting dark he started to head back and found that his ATV wouldn't start. He then noticed that the battery was not connected anymore. 
He reconnected it and started to drive but it wasn't going fast at all. Less than a half mile later the whole thing died. He radioed back basically saying hey guys, I need someone to come pick me up. They told him they would but it would be an hour. He asked if the other guy got back and they said no. He settled down and started a small fire but before long he heard voices again. It's dark. He's not happy. The voices sound like an argument now. Someone was angry and yelling at someone else who sounded more scared. He called out and asked if anyone needed help. The voices didn't seem to care. He guessed they had to be less than a 1000 feet away. He radioed again and they said they were having trouble finding what path he might be on and haven't left yet. He asked them just to get the other ranger to tell them about where they are because he left with the iPad, that had the map. They said he still isn't back. About three more minutes go by and he hears the voices start up again. He decides to walk to them hoping maybe they can stop being drunk assholes and maybe have a map. He walked in their direction but the voices seemed to be getting further as he got closer. Finally after 20 minutes he gave up and walked back. He got a radio call and they said the other guy was found passed out covered in vomit and was being taken to the hospital but he crossed off everywhere they found a stand so they have a general idea where he is. Then the radio died. Then the voices came back. Bored out of his mind he decided to listen to what they were arguing about picking up things like well it wasn't yours to take I don't care you knew better and so on. His guess was two hunters arguing over a kill. Then he heard the one shout something intelligible, then silence, the, uh, bang, a gunshot. He doused his fire and hid. After that he heard nothing, just his breathing for the next half hour until he saw ATV lights. He told the guy picking him up everything and they called back. They had people looking for three hours and found nothing. They came back the next day with police and dogs. After about an hour a shallow grave was found and in it was a long dead man who had clearly been shot in the face. Thing was, it was a skeleton who was there for years. So either the argument he heard just ended with a bang and both parties went home last night, or he heard the murder of someone from years ago. Small chance on the cause of one ranger's story from about a decade or so ago. I was hunting public land with my dad, several miles from anything close to a trail. So the day goes by and not much is going on, weather is bad and I'm not hearing distant gunshots, so I reckon the deer aren't moving much. I radio to the old man that I'm gonna head back, and we make plans to rendezvous where we had split up that morning. Twenty or so minutes later, I was kneeling around the edge of a pond, stripping off all my bulky camo layers. I was just messing around, putting stuff in my bag while I listened to my earphones. I can't remember if I had taken my blaze orange hat off or not to remove my pullover, but I had all the appropriate gear to denote myself as a hunter in my possession. As I was digging through my bag I thought I heard that faint bass of someone yelling, so I took an earbud out and noticed that crouched on the opposite edge of the pond, there was a lone forest ranger kinda just watching me. I stood up, but didn't wave, and I wasn't sure he had even yelled to me in the first place so I didn't holler anything to him. We just kinda locked eyes for what felt like a few minutes. To be clear, we weren't doing anything illegal, my rifle was unloaded by that point, though slung over my shoulder, obscuring the fact the action was open, and were following all laws and regulations. I hunched back over to my bag, pulled out my walkie and radioed to my dad we've got company. My motives weren't nefarious, I just didn't want my dad to come bumbling down the hill and be surprised by a friendly law enforcement officer. When I looked back up, maybe 15 seconds later, that ranger was gone. I mean flat out gone. So eventually I meet back up with my dad and start to tell him about what happened. Yeah, as deep back in here as we are, he probably thought we were up to no good, and hit the trail when he saw you on a radio. They get ambushed like that. As someone who gets nervous, anxious, around cops, it never occurred to me that I could be causing similar anxiety in them. If you're reading this DNR bro, I'd like to offer you a heartfelt my bad, 
and keep up the good work. My grandpa had a hunting buddy in the 70s who was basically a hermit in the woods of the Pacific Northwest. He was staying with him in his cabin deep in the Cascade Mountains during a hunting trip. No running water, no electricity. Miles away from the nearest town or paved road. His cabin was built on stilts and on an incline. It had a 10 feet balcony from the base of the bottom of the stilts with no stairs or ladder to climb up on. My grandpa claims that he knew this man for a long time, and said that he didn't have the personality to lie. I've also known my grandpa to never be one for BS. One night, during the trip, they were relaxing at the cabin after a hunt, and his buddy tells him that Sasquatch is in the area and to be careful going out at night. Thinking he was pulling his leg, my grandpa chuckled and didn't think much about it. His friend then put on a very serious face and grabbed a few pieces of fruit, bread, and jerky and placed them in a bowl. He took the bowl out onto the balcony and set it on the edge and said it'll be empty in the morning, and then went to bed. It was an open floor single room cabin, about 300 square feet my grandpa had a cot set up near the balcony window and was woken up in the middle of the night by rustling outside. He peeked through the window and saw the bowl, empty, and to this day still claims he saw four fingers resting on the edge of the balcony just before letting go. He never went hunting in that area again. When I was a kid in the Colorado Rockies, I was taking my horse and the whole band of dogs we had, two labs, an Aussie and a Dachshund, to our pond by my grandparents' place. I decided it was a great idea to venture the back way through the thicker part of the pine forest. I knew the way and so did the animals, horse included. About five minutes from the house, I was oblivious to the world and didn't notice that the dogs were no longer with me. When I finally decided to come back to the real world and notice the missing dogs, I turned back since you don't go anywhere without them. They were basically my guardians and supervisors up there. I get about halfway back to the house, come up a small gully heavily filled with pines and there is this huge tom, cougar, just staring at me, right in the path. I made at the time, a little guy and a tasty morsel for this animal. Luckily, I had the horse, who upon seeing the animal immediately bolted directly back to the pasture. The cat seemed to run after us, didn't really watch. We roll up into the drive, head towards the pasture and I agree that this ends my adventures for the day. After I put the horse up, the dogs find me again and we are walking back to the house when they get real jumpy and timid. I stop and begin to look around. There is a large and old pine splitting the distance between the pasture and the house and on the lowest branch, I see the damn Tom again. Luckily, the presence of the dogs deterred any action but I made it a point to pass far away from the tree, and as calmly as I can I tell my grandpa what happened. He goes outside, rifle in hand and never found the bastard. To this day, I never venture out without a dog or a weapon, just in case. I've had some weird stuff happen but I'm probably the cause of a lot more unexplained sightings. I used to spend a lot of time in the forest near my neighborhood, it's a small strip of trees that's biggest inhabitant is a fox. I got into vulture culture slash taxidermy about a year ago, I've always been a fan of zoology and being able to look at animals in a different way is incredibly interesting. When I was getting into it the fox in the forest had just had kits and was hunting over time to feed them. I started kind of an exchange where I'd pick up bones and such from around the den and if I found fresh corpses elsewhere I'd leave the meat around the den instead of wasting it. Unfortunately this garnered me the reputation of outcast slash horrible dead animal lady from most of the kids who liked to play in the forest and noticed me carrying bags of rotting animal parts around. As far as I'm aware none of them actually knew anything about me aside from the rotting meat and the time I accidentally busted through with a bunch of live snakes. So that should pretty well cement their opinion on me.
We were camping along the Sunshine Coast in lower mainland British Columbia. It was the off-season so not too many campers in the area and we were in some beautiful land, lush jungle-like forested areas right beside the ocean. 5 a.m. in the morning, right before dusk, right behind our tent, we were camping by literally no other people, I hear. Hui. Hui. As loud as can be. I woke up real quick and asked my husband if he heard that and what he thought that was. He says, do you want me to be honest with you? Uh yes? I think it was a Sasquatch, and I'm like no way, Therese just no way. I started thinking about all the animals in the area and different calls they would make and I'm a pretty avid camper and live in the country, so I do recognize calls of different animals. Cougar? Bear? No, nope. All? Nope. I didn't go to sleep and kept the knife in my hand for another hour before the sun came up, while I was on my phone googling what Sasquatch sounds like. I know there's a ton of conspiracy around this but we did find a recording of a supposed Sasquatch that sounded similar to what we heard. Can't find it now, I'll keep looking. We went into town later that day and told a local and he's like yeah, lots of sightings around here. The natives even have totems dedicated to them. I work at a summer camp taking kids on canoe trios for a few days at national parks. One night after setting up campsite and quenching the fire I was doing last check of the campsite. I looked at the lake and saw this lone man paddling a canoe. I thought it was pretty strange but it's not out of the ordinary, the only weird thing being that he was alone. He waved so being the polite Canadian I am I waved back. Went to bed in the staff tent and everything was normal. I had a bit of trouble sleeping that night so I decided to go stargazing as that usually calms me down. I exit the tent and see this man on our campsite, looking through our tarps and bags. For what I don't know, maybe drugs or food but that's not important. This stranger is by the campers I am responsible for. We make eye contact and this guy stands up. He is tall as all hell and I am quite short so I quickly grab the first thing I can think of. A can of bear mace. This stuff is meant to like kill a charging bear so I hold it ready to spray and tell him to GTFO of my campsite. We doesn't really speak just like oh, I, didn't, see, you, guys. When he is leaving I immediately wake up the other staff and we make sure he leaves. We use our SAT phone to call park rangers with our position, the guy's characteristics and tell them the story. Without a doubt the scariest moment I had won the job. I've learned not to fear animals, as for the most part they are predictable dumb and not malicious. But people on the other hand. The scariest and most dangerous thing to encounter out in the wilderness is a person. So my dad is a forestry technician and this happened to one of his coworkers. They were up doing some sort of job in the very most northerly part of Ontario. Anyways it was in the middle of the night and she was half asleep and vaguely heard something outside her tent. Then she felt something push against her tent and the zipper slowly open. She opened her eyes and saw the head of a polar bear in her tent. Polar bears are far from the cuddly toys that you see and they are known to be super aggressive and will hunt and eat people. She laid there paralyzed with fear thinking that it was the end and then slowly the bear retracted its head and left. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.